Mortal Realms and Age of Sigmar story phase. Grab your hammer so we can clear a path through the chaos and forge our own narratives in the Age of Sigmar. Your allies through the Ten Paradises this episode are... Hey, my name is Paul, and did you guys hear there's this, like, splinter faction in the U.S. who is just really not about American measurement? They want to form their own country here, but they want to use British measurement. They're calling it Yometrica. Uh, that's a little too real. Uh, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I'm Josh, and I'm ready to climb the Teclian ladder to illumination. Hey, I'm, I'm Pavin. Um, what do you call the first thing a Lumineth Realm Lord learns in school? What? The alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Aaron, and I'm so bright. My dad calls me son. Uh, in this episode, we cover the lore of the Lumineth Realm Lords battle tome and get ready to hear a whole lot of condescension self-aggrandizing and emotional suppression and then if we have time after all that we'll talk about those high elves um hey how are you guys tonight my gentle elves how are you doing i feel great you sound great doing fantastic you sound fantastic (laughs) top it top it top (laughs) it pavement ah pretty good oh wrong direction oh Oh, okay You, you sound you sound better than pretty good um i am Glad to hear it. Guys, we're back. It's been ever so long. I'm not going to try and count how long it's been since we've had an episode, um, but let's do it again. We're, we're, we're ready and rearing, um, and it's brand new army. How could we not? We got we to gotta stamp it with our own personal take on, this, on these realm lords from the realm of Hish. But before we do so, uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to know what you all been up to. It's been a long time. I'm sure you've, you've worked on some amazing projects, gotten a lot of work done. Um, I'd love if you told me about it, and I'll start just in the same order that we went before. Paul. What yeah. you been up to? Uh, my current project that I'm working on is adding every model that's in the Caradron Overlord's range to my Grot Bag Scuttlers. So I'm in the midst of painting an Ironclad, the um, Underworld Warband, and the new um, Engineer with the balloon, and all kinds of stuff. So I'm having a great time. Painting those up to match the rest of my Grop Egg Scuttlers. So, been a good time. Right on. I had a great time hearing you talk about it. Well, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Hey, Josh. Josh, what you been doing? Um, let's see. In the interim, I've uh, worked on some additional Warcry terrain for my custom board at the end of our last Dogs of Warcry season. So, just got to get that painted up. And then eventually, hopefully, Pavin and I will get a game on it and try it out. Uh, done a little bit of Age of Sigmar as well with uh, Ben helping him play test the Cities of Sigmar force that he's putting together. So that's been a lot of fun. Nice. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, well, I was going to make fun of you about the 40k thing, but you didn't bring it up, so I'm not going to bring it up. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> Pavend, please uh, tell me what, you, what you've what you been doing. Uh, 40k mostly? You uh, son of a... <laughs> Well, I got, I got, you told me that, yeah, we got on the ninth edition hype train. And so I added my, uh, craft world Eldar force. I'm feeling pretty good about those additions. Um, I'm hoping to break my record of like four 40 K games this edition. Uh, so we <laughs> get five, although the, the pandemic hasn't made anything easy. Uh, me and Josh are also working on, uh, the first, or we've recorded the first episodes of the dog who war cry. So that'll oh, yeah. have been out or it's, pretty late by the time this comes out actually it's gonna be a race let's see who gets out yeah, first you know, ooh. <laughs> um, so that's very exciting i've since swapped to some war cry projects but those will be coming that's it for me yeah awesome and great um for myself i don't even know when the last time i would have talked to you fine listeners would have been um i know i've been working on war cry terrain the stuff that comes in those boxes and so I'm almost done. But Aaron, it's been months and months. How are you not done yet? Hey, get off my case. Um, But I need to finish just a couple trees from that. The set that has the trees in it. You guys know. What's it called? Soul Drain Forest. That yeah. one. I knew you, I, I knew I had the experts here who could tell me. Um, if I just got to put a couple more leaves on and then all the Warcry terrain is done, with that is to say built um, just in time for the catacombs to come out. But then additionally, I have been starting to paint up some corn dudes. What? Aaron painting? What? That's paint? weird. No. Yeah, that's insane. But I had all these. I've been <laughs> literally just buying contrast paints and then never opening them. And I figured I should probably crack them. <laughs> so I, okay. I, painted a little fi- I painted a little five man. Nice. Nice. What can you do? What can you do with that? Nothing. It's not enough for anything. But you uh, can Warhammer Quest Five can look pretty. Oh yeah, maybe actually Shadows of Hammerhall have, have blood yeah, That's a good. Point. Exactly. Wandering monsters too. Yeah. Awesome. All right. We'll have to get back into that. You know, four years later. Um, <laughs> but that 
is what I've been up to. Paul, let's 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 do a story phase. Would you would you be willing to to take us there? Indeed. In the story phase, we delve into the stories, characters, creatures, and environments of the nine realm. Man, you do it so well. I've been missing that. I should have I should have just taken that recording, plucked <laughs> it out, and then played it uh, every time every time I go to bed. Um, anyways, so let's <laughs> talk about the Lumineth Realm Lords, uh, a battle tome, a uh, new army. Uh, I'm not new battle tome because honestly, at the time of this recording, it's been out for months and months, but only for those uh, money bags, rich kids who bought the. <laughs> Special, uh, edition. special limited edition yeah um mm-hmm. must be nice from up there in your ivory tower which is fun because it works uh on like a high elf uh, level too but finally the us 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 plebs us folk, folks mucking around in the in the back alleys we're finally able to get our hands on the um battle tome and we wanted to talk about it so here we are cool 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 since we're dealing with a new army i think the best place to start it's at the beginning it's a very good place to start uh it's a new army. Where, where do they come from? Like, who are they? Like, we're going to blow this wide open. What I need from you, as as I've been doing recently, and by recently, I use that in quotes, what is recently anymore? Um, I want <laughs> a one-sentence summary of the Lumineth Realm Lords. And this better be off the cuff. You better not have prepared anything. Um, give me your best one-sentence summary that encapsulates the army as a whole. Get, paint me a picture uh, right. in one sentence or less. Um, but Paul, lead us off. I'm going to go with, they are elven addicts who have realized the error of their ways and now embrace the earth as everything that will tell them how to be better people. Uh, But still they hate everybody else around them because they don't want to talk to anybody else because they're totally better than them. I'm going with that. Loose definition of sentence, but I'll, I'll, it counts. I mean, (laughs) run on sentences. I mean, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you said it was supposed to be off the cuff, right? I mean, yeah, that's, I, that's, that's true. <laughs> you just got you. You do wear big cuffs. Um, <laughs> Josh, would you be would you be so kind as to give me your version of a one sentence summary of the the realm lords? Definitely, definitely. So, so my impression was they're, they're they're high elves, but with a definitely have an Eastern philosophical bent and pulling from all sorts of areas: Tibetan, Shinto, Buddhism, Tao. And I uh, thought that was really interesting. So uh, th- I thought that was really int- yeah. I suppose that could be separated by a comma. Okay, that's fine. Still one <laughs> semicolon. 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 Even oh man, that's everyone's get out of jail free card. That semicolon. You can do a lot of work <laughs> with that. Um, Paven, do you, do you have a one sentence summary for us? Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna do it live. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> it. We'll do it live. <laughs> it worked well for me. All right. Don't start the clock. <laughs> Pretty much the old high elves, but. This time they got animal elemental friends. Period. Sure. Period. End of sentence. It's uh, concise, succinct, persuasive. I liked it. I loved it. Uh, and since I'm the one who's asking the question, I don't have to give a sentence. Next, um, let's jump into <laughs> can uh, I, the order. Can I put an aside in here, quick? Uh, which which side? My side. I want to lay this <laughs> out here. So two years ago, in the scrying phase, I predicted. Geomancer halflings. Yes. And lo and behold, what is this army? But Geomancer... <laughs> Not that. Twinlings. They are half Tyrian, half Teclas. I mean, come on. For something that was a complete shot in the dark, for it to actually no, theoretically apply. No, point zero. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I get the Geomancer that part. literally nothing. <laughs> yeah, but... Although I, I'm so inclined to agree, and and I had already preemptively uh, assigned Paul no points when he started talking. The fun play on words with like halflings, and there's mm-hmm. like half. I mean that that's that's a little bit. Good like geomancer point. though. Geomancer definitely yeah. was in there. I'll give you half half points, and All may right. God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> fair, fair point. <laughs> so. Uh, new army. We're gonna have to start at the beginning to get to get at the origin of of this of this force. Um, and I'm gonna point to Paul uh, yep. to take us on a, just to start our journey off um, mm-hmm. on, on where these folks where these folks come from. What's their deal? The Lumineth Realm Lords come from Hish, which is the realm of light. So it is one of the eight realms of the mortal realms, and they come actually originally from Slanesh. They came from Slanesh's belly. So they are actually a race of elves that have been pulled out of a chaos god. And they are not the first, the second, the third, or the fifth necessarily, um, but they are the purest. They are the ones that Teclis looked at them and was like, this is good. 
I can work with this. Um, and they form themselves into this just massive civilization of enlightenment and understanding. Um, and it form, it goes from everything from intelligence, education, martial prowess, magic, everything that you can imagine. They are very much the pinnacle of enlightenment in the mortal realm. That is true, um, as is want of those residents of, of the, the realm of Hish. And so um, if they came from Slanesh, maybe we rewind even even farther back. It sounds like the, the originator of this of this faction is is uh, is Teclas, um, mm-hmm. but even he has sort of a start, right? Even he has sort of a beginning yes. in these in these mortal realms. From whence does he come uh, in in this space? And I'm arbitrarily saying in the age of myth, let's not go too far uh, back. Uh, we start off with Tyrion showing up in Hish. Interesting thing to note here is that uh, there was no one around when Tyrion uh, awoken, awoke, came to consciousness, whatever. Um, and he was a god. Um, there are no believers, as opposed to Shayish, where gods are made from the beliefs of the living. Um, Tyrion just simply was a god. Uh, and he hears Teclis calling him. Um, he feels the absence of his brother, but yet feels him calling him on the wind. Uh, in the air, and he uh, basically starts at the center of the realm and explores to the edge of the realm. This just fantastical, perfect geomet- geometric paradise. Um, and when he gets to the the edge of the realm, he blacks out and he wakes up, and lying next to him is Teclas. Everyone's favorite uh, master mage. Clown, late, yeah. Everyone loves him. Everyone's yeah. favorite character. Yeah, well, can we uh, just... Uh, I, I just want to jump in here for our maybe our listeners who aren't as familiar with ancient Warhammer lore that Tyrion and Teclis were actually um, kind of heroes from the world that was, and so mm-hmm. they are reoccurring characters, and they were twins, although not gods, but very powerful twins, and that were killed during the end times. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, so these are, so the Tyrion, like many of the greatest heroes from the Ed times is one of those people that wake up like Alariel, Malarion, Sigmar, although Sigmar actually didn't wake up in the mortal realms. He was transported there, I guess. Yeah. He was, he he surfed his way there. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, maybe Nagash. Um, so it's interesting that it seems like a certain subset of characters just kind of show up. Maybe the ones that were most connected to the realms. I don't know what the logic is, but I wanted to at least provide some of that context. But please, Paul, I'm sorry for the interruption. Keep going. No worries. So they managed to explore this like gorgeous new realm. Um, and the irony is that Tyrion was woken whole. But because he went to go search for his brother at the edge of the realm, his eyes have actually been burned out. And when he woke up next to Teclis... Um, he is blind. Would you say he was blinded by the light? Blinded oh, yeah. by the light! Exactly. All right. Hey, everyone. Can it, I just we're back in here and just say a couple <laughs> points I thought were really interesting in this story? Please, Please do. do. Do you mind? Okay. Um, so, yeah, he does get blinded. He gets blinded by the edge of the realm, like at that super mm-hmm. magic area that only... Perimeter. Inimical. Inimical. Yeah, and he actually communes, I believe, with the spirit of Hish itself. So mm-hmm. that with the magic is personified as it can be. And I don't know if we've ever had such uh, personification of the realms before. And so that was nope. interesting that the that the magic was separate from the god most aligned to it, which is Tyrion and, and Teclis. But, he was, but it was a separate force he could interact with and, I guess, trade something for where he traded his eyesight for his brother. Mm-hmm. So that's, yep. that was interesting. Definitely. Right, go ahead, go ahead. So what they are able to do is as they are wandering, um, Sigmar pops down. They're like, dude, barbarian god of like Yokel Town. But hey, you're from the old world and we recognize you. And that's super cool. And he informs them that indeed, though they cannot find any elves in Hish, the elves do exist in the mortal realms and they're actually up in Azir. Uh, but unfortunately, they're not the elves that they're going to form this great nation out of. Um, they are able to make contact um, through intervening realms with Malarian and Marathi. 
And they basically are able to figure out that Slanesh has these elven souls. And they work out a plan to be able to steal those elven souls from Slanesh. Imagine imagine being the elves living in like Azir and finding out that like you're too like elf gods like around and are kicking and they're like oh no hey hey we're here like you found us we're, we're great and two elves are like eh we're gonna keep looking <laughs> yeah yeah but, right. no but no but we're but we're but we're we're, we're elves we're cool and, uh, we're, i'd rather dig them out of the, a dead god's body before i would <laughs> yeah, hang out right. with you guys um <laughs> uh a fun detail to add to that story is that the where the elven gods meet um, mm-hmm. is actually Shyesh because mm-hmm. they can't travel because uh, Malarian can't travel to Haish because his relationship to Shadow mm-hmm. and um, the, the 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 twin gods of light can't uh, travel to Ugu because of their relationship to Hish and those being so diametrically opposed. Um, yep. So I, they all go to Shyesh. I don't remember why, but that's where they meet and they're allowed to like broker their, their peace and their plan. Yeah. There has to be nicer places. Yeah. The Tyrion and Teclis run into a a, a sage there and he says, Oh, you know, yes, your, your malarian, I don't know, brother, relative of some sort is still alive. He's an Olgu and you guys can meet here. And so then then that's how they broker contact, meet there and then move on to say, Oh, we've, we've probably got a sub realm. Let's go meet there. We could both all arrive and and discuss future plans and actions. Yeah, so Ooh, that sage is definitely Zinch. Yeah, right. <laughs> totally for sure. <laughs> I mean, possibly. Yeah, yeah, because he orchestrated Slanish's abduction, right? So yeah, just some guy. Cool. Well, so that's actually a really interesting thing about this specific battle tome. I'll be the judge of that. That's fair. You were waiting on that for a long time. We're, we're back, and you're welcome. everybody. We're back. <laughs> Uh, is that we have a lot of agents in this story and agents being people who are able to affect the plot and change it, who are not necessarily independent of the battle tone whatsoever. So this sage is a very important character because he informs um, Tecla Centurion of the existence of Malarion. And as we move on, there are more and more uh, people, you know, like the interacting with Hish itself exactly is another point where, we have a lot of agents in this story that don't have a connection to the rest of the realms whatsoever. So there's a lot of just plot points that really are showing up. This person is important and then move on, um, mm-hmm. which is a, a lot different from most of the other battle tomes that we had because in the OCR Bone Reapers battle tome, it was very much about composing this army and this almost history of, the battles that have been won um, by the OBR and all the other battle tomes have very much been primarily about the race, but this one is far more about the interaction of the realms and the interaction of all of these different people. We just have these characters showing up that have agency. Um, And I think that's a really interesting um, place where there's a lot of different histories that could be told from the same perspective because we have these characters that, pivot the story yeah and i think it's because this is the first entry into the whole lore where like osiark bone reapers we already had a lot of door lore about shaish and and some mm-hmm. and how nagash works and everything else so they really got to lay out the story here and give us uh, different views and perspectives on how this all came to be which is really it's really cool mm-hmm. kind of get on the ground floor here yeah, actually, to that to that point, it, it, the battle tome almost kind of doubles as a is it's a Lumineth battle tome, but it's also maybe a, a Hish battle tome at the at the same mm-hmm. time because they're so intrinsically intertwined. Uh, but then also, it's a place that we haven't really been before. To to, to Josh's point, which is uh, fun. Also, I just kept thinking every time you said the word history, Paul, I just mm-hmm. wanted to chime in with with hi- history. <laughs> 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 you get, but I mean, you guys, you oh, guys man. get it. You get Josh. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, that was anyways. So the coffee has settled in. Here we go. Uh, hold on tight. So um, I think it, then it's interesting, and you guys can be the judge of that, um, that this is, this is yet another um, battle tome or, or a, a information delivery mechanism that, that is going to talk about the, like what basically had happened um, with the, the jailing of Slanesh. And I think we've on this show have talked about it a couple of times now, right? Because it's been brought up in the Slanesh battle tome and wrath of the ever chosen and the Deepkin battle tome. So it's, it's, it's been talked about a lot. Um, and one of my questions I'm going to pose to you guys is, did we learn anything new in this battle tome about 
the the event of the the jail like the, the luring and jailing of Slanesh in the hidden gloaming. Uh, yeah, I, I feel we did. Um, you know, there's a section in the lore where it talks about Malarian uh, seducing or taking of some mages that uh, that learned some of the shadow magic while he was helping Sigmar build some things uh, like the gladi- gladiatorial arena. You know, and how that he uses that those mages to help construct these chains of, uh, you know, shadow and light to hold Slanesh. So mm-hmm. I thought that was an interesting point that I hadn't seen before. Yeah. There is also a very interesting note where it says that in order to correctly retrieve these souls, Malarian and Mal- and uh, Malarian Marathi. and Marathi are in Olgu, and Tyrion and Teclis are in Hish, but they have to extract the souls at the same time. So, number one, it, it says that there is some form of communication or planning that is necessary, even for just the extracting of the souls. But number two, it has to be a one-on-one exchange, right? If Olgu gets an elf soul or five souls, then Hish must also get the same amount of souls. So, the, the other main theme that keeps going on in this book is this idea of twins, so we have yep. the twinning of Teclis and Tyrion, but we also have the twinning of the twins with the mother and son of Marathi and Malarion. And also, of course, Olgu and Hish. So twinning and communing with another person is an, an immensely powerful theme throughout the whole book. Hashtag twinning. I get, I get it. Um, it's, it hadn't really occurred to me that like the, it's like the, the siblings on the one side and then like the, the mother son relationship. So very f- f- equal and opposite, like sort of familiar, not opposite, but like familiar relations, familial relationships on um, either side. And I remember in, it must have been the daughter's battle time, but uh, where they talked about how Marathi was taking more than her fair share. And mm-hmm. that was just sort of glossed over like, oh, she's, she's, she's disrupting the balance. But I think this really maybe highlights or clarifies that like, the balance is, is specific and necessary and literally a one-to-one like balance. And mm-hmm. so just the sheer, if she, if she took one extra one, it would, it would have been en- enough to throw off the equation. Um, and I think we know that's led to a chain breaking. Is that true? Or it's just speculated that it's going to, well, or it means weakened in the process in some way. It's definitely been a weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Destabling Slanesh. So he's like more sensible because he's moving, he's closer to Ugu because they've taken more from Ugu. Um, gotcha. mm. I, um, and so that was supposedly destabilizing. Um, I just want to mention two points. One is that, I don't know, this one's irrelevant, but that uh, Tyrion Teclis are actually related to Malarian. Uh, he's their like uncle from way, way, way back. Um, so it's all, it's all families with the elves. Um, but I also, a, a couple of things we learned about the Slanesh um, taking of the souls out. I think we, they talk a little bit how, that the Eidneth were the first attempt. And we knew that, and they were kind of a, a failure because of their weakening souls and their kind of uh, 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 it, mental issues, I guess. And then there were a couple iterations after that where they were that where the elves were like monstrous or angelic, and, uh, and then eventually Teclis lands on the Lumineth Realm Lords, which were the most stable and the most kind of perfect versions of what they were looking for. So there, what there is this group of things we haven't seen that were weirder, and so that's cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. I wasn't sure if those were like the Kinnerai and things like that, or if that's something the Marathi did after the Lumineth were pulled out. So I haven't, uh, I don't, so, I don't know enough about the uh, the Canite battle tome to know if it was before or after or during. So Phil Kelly did uh, go on the Warhammer Community podcast, uh, and there's specifically a Lumineth ep- episode. And he specifically said that everything after the Ivaneth, but before the Lumineth, has not been talked about and has not oh. been revealed. Not that okay. there necessarily is a plan, but he specifically called out that the Ivaneth were the first, the Lumineth were at least the fifth, and that was leaving space for possible future who knows what. Gotcha. So that's definitely well, if, a thing. If Phil Kelly talked about this stuff, then why are we talking about it? That's it. He doesn't Wrap know it what's up. really going on. <laughs> you can't trust him. He's just—he's a company mouthpiece. You can't trust a word he says. <laughs> oh come on! No. Corp, corporate I mean, bull. Yeah, we, we're, we're hiding the truth of the mortal realms from you, listeners. <laughs> I'm just saying. 
I, like, I think th- that the really interesting thing when you listen to somebody like Phil Kelly talk is that he's not actually reading a book and telling you about it. He's literally just like going through his imagination and being like, this is what I put on the page. It's like a tour guide through the realms, right? Literally, he can't lose a trivia contest because whatever he says becomes the new right answer, right? <laughs> and if you and if yeah. you tried to trump him with something to be like, no, it actually, but the book says this, he'd be like, mm, you would think so, wouldn't you? But he'd say in sweet British accent. Am I five to go change it in the battle film? No one will right. <laughs> no know. This is fact. And he and he and he would too. That Phil Kelly's a sly devil. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we're making a lot of good progress. We're still in the age of myth here. Right. <laughs> sure. So Slanesh is trapped. And I thought I was doing a good job about like glossing over the whole Slanesh thing, but yet here we are. Um, so Slanesh is trapped. They're yanking souls out of them. They're creating a society still in, in the age of myth. Um, any other ma- age of myth things either generally, or there's those stories, the, those timeline stories that maybe folks thought were interesting. If there's anything that uh, caught your eye there, by all means, bring it up now. Now would be a great time to do that. Um, they well, one thing is cool that they explicitly mention that the Lumineth hate other realms and don't want to be there, and that's why they're not there. They like they find it like they feel dumber uh, when they're when they're in the other realms. And I like the idea um, that like you know people talk well, why, why folks who are who've been following the lore and following the storyline, there's like oh, there's this huge, very powerful army. How can we? It's been five years. How have we not seen them before? And you could you could stop and try and think of this creative, involved, intricate story as to why this army wouldn't appear. But sometimes the simple answers are the best. They just hate you, and they're not gonna they're not gonna show up. They have no interest in the world. Period. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, elitism. You, I, you know what? Elitism can explain can explain a lot of stuff. Xenophobia of sorts, but not really because they're scared, just because they think it's the best place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's also like an, an addictive relationship they have with like the enlightenment of Hish and the realm stone, and like yep, they yep. like feel like more amped up and smarter and faster. And uh, so, the ten paradises is a really important thing that we probably have to talk about. Um, where we're talking about the age of myth. So this is the place that... We don't have to do anything. I mean, I'll be the judge of that. Uh, but... <laughs> Touche. All right. Um, um, so the Ten Paradises is this basically mirror image of eight realms. So four and four. And then there's this realm on the outside of the circle. And then there's a realm on the inside of the circle. Um and these four I, either side of the mirror realms are literally mirror realms of each other. So when they talk about the Ten Paradises, they're basically just absolutely gorgeous perfection. Um, and when we're talking about the twinning, I think the, the Ten Paradises is something that is very unique to Hish. And unlike everything else that we've seen before, because it is like the wheel of the spoke of a wheel, right? Um, it also is like the eight points of the chaos star. There's a lot of parallels in a lot of the imagery of AOS. And because of this inimical, uh, this edge of the realm, um, this becomes a very important thing that there's only certain people that can go to the edge of the realm, Tyrion being one, Teclis being the other. But then as we come into the center, not only is it where it's safer to live, but it's the only place where people other than elves actually live in Hish. And that's something that happens immediately in the Age of Myth, is that Sigmar is like, oh, hey, this island in the center is totally safe, so boom, we're going to drop you there, right? So as opposed to in the center of the old world, where we had this island where the high elves were, and then we have this storm of magic on the inside, we actually have this storm of the races, right? We have this maelstrom of the mixing pot, inside of uh, Hish. So that's kind of an interesting departure from what the old world was. And it's I think that starts to define who the Luminelf Realm Lords become because so many people don't even want to go to that island, right? So many of the elves are just like, I don't even want to talk to them or be around them because they are so below me. That's how I feel like when I come on this podcast. So guys, we're in <laughs> the Age of Myth. How do we get out of it? Uh, there, there's, I, I imagine there's some sort of dramatic arc that leads to uh, the transition of ages, uh, leading question. Uh, does anybody want to talk about, uh, what, what, what brings it all crashing down? Enlightenment. 
You know, obviously, as it always does. Obviously, let's keep them dumb. The the only catch with perfection, you know, and I think they kind of they they play with the luminary, the terminology throughout the whole battle tone, which is fun. Is you know, the, you know, they say they were everything was so perfect, so enlightened that they were all blinded to the faults. You know, that they they were so focused on being perfect, getting rid of their emotions with aether quartz and and being better than everybody else, and uh, and not. Not you know, not really dealing with emotions, but just getting rid of them through the aether courts, and then so tensions started to rise, where people started to become jealous or wanted more power, and they created these objects and, and, and magical weapons that oh, we're never going to use this. We just wanted to make something so powerful that we could show that we could do it, and then and then the, there started to be accusations about oh, you know, his in, his uh, his great climb to the up the ladder is is sponsored by demons you know he's gotten demonic influence and so people started throwing accusations around and started you know sabotaging each other and then insults were becoming openly thrown at each other and then the battles people started throwing weapons and attacking each other and destroying cities and and, and continents with words and uh, this massive magical damage opened up rifts in reality and warped reality in so many different places that Chaos was able to come flooding in. Slanesh, in particular, demons and, and things like that, were came flooding in to wreak havoc on what was left. Yeah, and it's wild. Um, and so they call this whole event or like time frame the Spire Fall, right? So like they they've reached such heights and it is all come crashing down. Um, I like I, I like this part, I guess. Um, in that I was I was wondering how they were going to integrate like the Age of Chaos into like Hish. Like so, we we kind of know the Age of Chaos general like story as it like sort of pertains to the rest of the mortal realms and sort of how it affected each realm and how it affected each god um and it's each realm sort of had their own like unique challenges and so it's neat to see the this brand of age of chaos sort of appearing um in hish in that it all sort of worked or like coincided with the, the larger efforts of those chaos gods um at the same time so i, I had always kind of wondered what it would it look like or how it work would work here and uh now we know i just want to throw out that it was r- really the elves' fault. Like, kind of, for the other realms, like, Chaos kind of wormed its way in and then slowly gained momentum and took over uh, with gods picking up particular realms. But really, the elves really destroyed themselves. Like, there was a little bit of whispers, and then Chaos eventually got in, but they really just, like, tore themselves apart in kind of a all-against-all civil war, where they just, like, destroyed their own society from the inside out. Um so that was cool. Yeah, I think that was a cool kind of twist on it where it was just like, you know, the other realms were like losing a war and like Hish just imploded. Yeah, that harkens back to a civil war from the world that was too. Yeah, I mean, it's a uniquely an elven sort of process or problem. <laughs> Being big dummies. Josh, you had mentioned ether, ether Quartz. Um, and so Ether Quartz is basically uh, the realm stone of Hish. Um, but it's an interesting thing because it's not just laying around. Um, ether quartz actually has to be created um, by magic. So the the realm stone of Hish is actually this light. Um, and you, Teclas, I think, was the first one to actually catch it. But then even when you catch it and you form it, it has to be prepared correctly. Otherwise, uh, there's some possible repercussions for not making it correctly. Um, and so this realm stone has a particular quality where that's where this enlightenment comes from. Not only is it from the actual light of the realm itself, but people can burn this ether quartz, uh, in order to increase their intelligence, increase their abilities. Um, and the ether quartz consumes part of their emotion, part of their, for a lack of a better word, humanity. Um, but then when it goes into the ether quartz, then the ether quartz itself becomes almost this like waste, waste product um, that will come in later when we're talking about the Cathalar um, as something that can be used as a weapon, but it is something that is a, kind of anathema to the elves themselves. And while it does drain the vast majority of their emotion, it doesn't drain it of all of it. And part of the problem with the Spirefall is that they drained off, it almost seems like the good emotions to a certain extent, and they were left only with the rage and the anger um, and jealousy, etc. Um, 
So as opposed to most of the realm stones and the other realm where they just kind of provide you magic, this realm stone actually consumes you, uh, but also benefits you at the same time. Mm-hmm. A balance. Yep. Exactly. It gives and takes. Yeah, all realm stones are very dangerous. It's kind of like part of their jam. Um, and so these are just like the danger is more insidious. Whereas, uh, like, what is it? The bright stone or whatever, the fire stone. I mean, it just blow up. It's just highly volatile. Like, you, you know what you're going to get. You just, uh, explosions with that one. Um, very cool. So, uh, it sounds like this spirefall is ushering in the Age of Chaos um, for these hapless realm lords. Um, what what does what the Age of Chaos uh, hold uh, for the, the realm of Hish? Um, how do they deal with it? Uh, and how do they come out the other side? Inquiring minds want to know. Um, so I think a couple big points here is the, you know, they, they once the demons are in, I think the elves try to start to mount a defense and defend their realms. Um, and Tyrion is instrumental here in leading the defense. And so um, I think I would say Hish never truly completely falls to chaos, like maybe the other realms we might think of, like uh, Akshi and Chaman, which were like really just uh, bastions of the uh, kind of uh, chaos but this was kind of like still a more active defense was happening um and then at the same time teclis goes on a spirit quest to i I think he started off just exploring the cosmos um but he also i think when he realizes like what kind of trouble his people are in like looks for answers and he finds the moon selenar right is that is that the name of the moon or the name of the spirit that's the both hope. both great well he finds the his moon friend and he talks to it for a long time and then he specifically one month exactly one month um that's not that long and then uh <laughs> and he talks to it specifically about some like what is going on with his people and then he starts to talk to it about chaos and how bad chaos is and that really warms up the moon because i guess the moon doesn't also doesn't like corruption and uh, the bad vibes that chaos has and then the moon opens up to Teclas and like shares its moon secrets and um, kind of teaches. And then Teclas kind of learns the way of communing with pieces of the realm, like, you know, actual like the very core natural elements of Hish. And I think of the mortal realms largely um, by, by communing with this, um, this moon entity, the celestial object. And then, him and the avatar of the moon kind of come down and they begin to teach this this level of enlightenment to the Lumineth people to help ground them and like kind of balance them out from their kind of obsessive behaviors. What I'm hearing from you, Paven, is that uh, basically uh, Teclis does this like yoga meditation, right? And he mm-hmm. finds out that the moon is made of cheese. <laughs> C-H-I, get it? Oh, chi. Oh, okay. So that joke works better when it's written out. Um, did uh, did this moon thing come out of left field for anybody else? Like, has there ever been any sort of like moon reference to the high elves? Yeah, Teclas has always had the moon motif, um, and I think he was blessed by Lilith, who is the moon goddess of the high elves. Oh darn it! I stand corrected. And, and Tyrion was was always tied to the sun. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um. Okay, then let me try a different angle, a, a different tactic. Try um, again. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Was Teclas ever a particularly spiritual dude? Like, was he ever really one who was trying to, like, attune to, I don't know, natural forces? He always seemed to be this arcane, like, messing with forces, sort of supernatural, as opposed to sort of the, the fundamental elemental stuff. Um, is that a new angle for him? Or has he always been like that? I would argue this is a new angle for him. Um he has always been on the quest of knowledge and he has always in particular been on the quest of knowledge of magic and sharing that magic as a way of being benevolent. Um, He's the one who started the colleges of magic with humans. Um, But I I do think that this mystical angle is kind of a new thing. Um, He was always a bit of a loner in the old world. And so, yeah, I agree, Aaron. I think you're absolutely correct. And, yeah. I, and I think it's uh it, it's interesting because both Tyrion and Teclis were elsewhere when the Civil War broke out because they were helping Sigmar in the realms doing something else, and so you know they get back and they're like, oh no, what's going on? And so they have to work together to start forming a defense. And Tyrion 
broad, you know, spreads his consciousness over the or Tyrion uh, works on the tactical defense and, and Teclis spreads his consciousness over the realm of Hish to kind of see where areas can be defended easily. And so then it's a more coordinated, effective combination. And so I think he, you know, maybe it's a point where he's like, you know, magic is powerful, enlightenment is powerful, but I, it, it wasn't enough. You know, and maybe that's why he turns to this more mystical angle. And uh, for me, it, it brought the question: Okay, well, do we have these these spirits, these beings in Hish? That you know, because it's the realm of Hish, and everything is enlightened. Or do the other realms have similar entities that we just haven't heard about yet? I have a hot take for you guys. Oh yeah, I can't wait to hear it. I don't think Teclas really learned anything or developed through his relationship with Selenar. It was just more knowledge for him like he is always on the quest for more knowledge and he's always been a teacher of some sort like he you know paul brought up that he taught all of the humans of the old world magic um and so he i mean this isn't the first time he's given a life philosophy to the lumineth like the teclean ladder pre-existed um the relationship with the elementary temp- temples who are we're going to talk about um but you know, people just started bragging about how enlightened they could be. And that was like kind of one of the things that led to the spire fall was like, oh, I'm the most enlightened, you know, out of everybody. Yeah. The higher you climb, the harder you fall. So I think this is Teclis just like trying something else or learning something new and just being like, hey, guys, use this. I think his people evolve and become more grounded. But I think Teclis is this Teclis going to Teclis and just <laughs> keep, exploring, keep learning, keep meddling. This is kind of like core to his character. He kept going up that ladder and left the cosmos. <laughs> yeah. It's actually an interesting point that you bring up the Teclean ladder um, because it states for elves to climb up the Teclean ladder is to go to the perimeter inimical, but on the top well, of not, the Not the perimeter inim- Yeah. On, on the, I don't know if it's called the same thing at the roof or just yeah, the outside the roof, is yeah. the perimeter. But to actually ascend too high is to ascend to madness. Right, and here we have Teclis ascending above the realm. It specifically says he's communing with spirits not of the realm sphere, and so this is a really interesting, I don't know, question nudge that it could be any anyone that he's talking to at this seminar. It could be you know the reincarnated Lilith. It could be one of the smaller chaos gods. It could be anything. I was just I was just gonna say, like the the moons of this world or universe do not have a great track record. Like it's very rare that a moon is a good good dude. Um I'm not saying I'm not saying it's impossible. Hey, Aaron, but... don't jump the gun. We have a whole moon section of this podcast. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, you're right. No, you're right. But yeah, so th- th- it is it begins this interesting question of who's actually in control. Um and I think the mystic thing could be explained by the fact that magic tends to have a personality or almost a spirit to it in the mortal realms. Um, and we're going to continue to explore that as it moves on. Yeah, it, it does talk about Selenar having a, a, a twin aspect too, where he's the twin to the son of the realm. And, and Teclis, since he's a twin, it, they, they found a bond in that sense. Wait, wait, he's not the twin to the sun. There is no sun. Hish is the No, sun. no, Hish, Hish is the sun to Selenar. He's the moon the, the true moon of Hish. I there was another so it describes it as, another as being moon. a twinning. There are there... more than one moon, yep. Uh, Selenar is called the true moon, but there are other moons of Hish. Exactly. Well, if I was wrong, I stand corrected. <laughs> Age of moons. <laughs> There's too many moons. All right, anyways. Um, <laughs> so it sounds like uh, the twin gods come back to help, uh, help their realm uh, survive the Age of Chaos. Um, Tyrion's coming back kicking butt but then teclas is coming back with this newfound knowledge that he has and he's imparting it to his servants yeah um tell me about how that manifests itself um in the the citizens of of hish well i just wanted to draw a correlation and it's been drawn in other places on the internet how how there's a lot of eldar eldari type lore from 40k in in the the new elves lumineth where they've had this fall but in, in the only case of 40k the eldar are still descending in their fall here the lumineth are found a path a new path or several paths and are are coming back up so they successfully made it to reforge themselves uh, and now are becoming something different so but there are some nice correlations there i want to know about what the something different is Expand on that. So I would go with um, Teclas comes back with what's called a Luna Sphinx. Um, so Selenar takes the shape of this 
winged um, leonine creation, but with a mask on it. Um, and this is the embodiment of Selenar upon the battlefield. Uh, but the other interesting thing is that what actually starts to turn the tide is that they start cauterizing these elven runes into Hish itself in order to seal Hish from chaos. So um, you wanna, when do you guys want to elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. So uh, it kind of goes back to this geomancy where they have, this, you know, because Hish, and, and again, you know, whether it correlates to other realms or not, Hish seems to be this very living uh, surface world. Where, you know, there are these spirits within it, and it, it itself is alive. And so they talk about the corruption of chaos causing dissolution of the land, where the land is starting to fall apart or break apart. And so they use geomancy to burn these runes you know, miles long into the surface of that of that area to stabilize it. And um, and this this continues to be a theme throughout the battle tome and, and, and their purpose as they go forward. But but even even the maps in the battle tome itself show certain continents and they show these gigantic runes that have been burned into the surface to stabilize the world so that's a tool that they have uh, and a very powerful and potent uh tool but how how do um how does the how does the race evolve um how does the the people how do they uh develop with this newfound knowledge well uh, aaron i think you're getting at is that one of the things that teclas brings back is the ability to commune with the spirits of the land and through this, um, you know, they, I think through trial and error and a lot of meditation and a lot of kind of uh, apologizing to the land they ravaged and destroyed, uh, the first elves start uh, start the elementary temples. And I think it was the mountain, the elves trying to commune with the mountains of the realms that are the first non techless entity to actually get a response from the land. And they, you know, they do it through kind of... Um, uh, sacrifice, self denial, self sacrifice, kind of fealty to the land, and saying like, "Hey, we are here to serve you," and kind of this, uh, this the exact opposite of pride, um, and like a humility that they gain, and they are able to bond with the elements and learn from them, and um, they're using that. They use that to kind of balance out their society and their psyche to like by putting themselves beneath something. Um, and so they, the kind of the, the temples, the main temples they found are the temples of the river, the mountain, the wind, and the zenith. That's exactly that what I wanted. Good job. Um, just fishing. I'm just fishing over here. Um, yeah, so they, they've developed these new ways of thinking, new ways of, of approaching, I guess, in a way, uh, ways of uh, waging warfare, right? Like making use of their newfound allies in the, the very... Um, setting in which they they live um to fight back uh these these forces of chaos and spoiler alert, they kind of do a good job right they're they're it's i mean by no means is it a is it ever a complete victory like they'll always be fighting chaos but like once they're able to harness these newfound powers and these newfound um like approaches mentalities um they're able to really um do a, I mean, a fairly good job of, of clearing out certain important areas uh, in the, the realm of Hish. Um, again, like it, it's not completely scoured of chaos. In fact, there's I think there's still plenty of other chaos controlled areas in this realm, but they've done a good job of s- securing footholds um, in their realm and retaking and starting to retake uh, their homelands back, which is which is important. Yeah, it's, it's really in a, kind of a direct conflict with. Um Kind of, or it's, it's very different from how the other realms were presented, especially at the beginning of the um, beginning of the the IP. Age of Sigmar. Yeah, uh, yeah, where like you know, Akshi was just real bad shape, right? Like there was like a few uncorrupted humans just kind of always sprinting away from death, um, and that's kind of the way that the Shaman was presented and Shayesh, and kind of like they were just on the break. And it seemed like Hish, kind of through its glamours and protections, um, didn't really need to be liberated by Sigmar. That the the Lumineth were liberating it themselves, kind of um, through their evolution and through their gods. Uh, so good for them. Yeah, good, good on you. Um, so it sounds like we're get, we're getting to the to the to the tail end of the Age of Chaos. Is there any other Age of Chaos stuff that you guys want to talk about? Any stories that jumped out at you, or other interesting tidbits? I think it's interesting that the Elementari bind with a specific location, right? So they bind with a mountain or they bind with a river, right? Or they bind with a wind. 
but yet, even though they have this respect for the realm... Or a zenith. That's correct. Or the top, right? Even though they have this respect for the realm and... This is my top, not your exactly. my top. Uh, they don't have the respect for the realm in general because they brand it, right? So they're literally marking either the realm as holy or unholy with their actions. And so I think it's interesting that they have that dichotomy, again, that twinning of the holy places and the places that can be sacrificed. Imagine being a mountain that gets branded as like unholy. The, You're like, come on, man. The brand sanctifies it. The brand yeah, yeah, it, it stabilizes. Like, it's you don't stabilized. want a house on the brand. It also turns it into a wasteland. I don't think, the, I think that like the, the brand is for a place that is corrupted by chaos. And like has a hole that like deep gross demons are coming out of. And you put the brand over it and it's it's better. Okay. I don't know. Well, it, I mean, it depends. Define better. Like depends who you ask. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like when they put like uh, windmills out in a far- farm field. Like some people just don't like looking at the windmills. Um, realms relativists. Yeah, well, I think it's kind of like, you know, the Indian mountains we have around here, right? You know, you can't really see what it is if you're on the ground level until you get higher up. And you're like, oh, wait, there's this huge symbol on the ground. You know, it, it could be something similar to that. Where once it's done and it's healed, perhaps you don't really know it's there. Hmm, interesting. All right, so Age of Sigmar or Age of Chaos is over? Yeah, I would say it's so. going. Sure. Well, because because no no, there's very clear demarcations. Age of, Age of Chaos is done. Age of Sigmar has started. Um, and one of the great uh, ways, I mean, one of the hallmarks of the Age of Sigmar in other places is that the Stormcast has sort of been re- released, right? And they're out out there take, retaking lands and stuff. And uh, Sigmar has the great idea. It's like, oh, maybe I'll send some send some dudes over to Hish. Like, it, it looks like they could use a hand. And the Stormcast roll up, and the uh, Lumineth are like, nah, we, we've got this. In fact, you know what? I don't like the way you look. And they almost come to blows uh, until they come to an understanding, and then they end up fighting together. But it's almost like, mm, you're a little superfluous to this issue. Like, we don't necessarily need you. Um, but then, of course, they do, because they're the poster boys of the Age of Sigmar. But still, um, it, it goes to show that uh, the Lumineth do sort of seem to have the issue um, to air in hand at, at the very least um, in their, their realm. Well, I thought that was a, I was just going to say, adding to that story, I thought it was funny because they essentially the Stormcasters, you know, is saying there's some demons let us through. We need to go fight them. And, the, you know, the Lumineth say, no, we're not going to let you pass. You know, they don't, they don't degrade themselves low enough to explain why they just eventually wait. And then there's avalanches coming down that are controlled, you know, by the elementary. And then the stormcasts are like, "Oh, okay. Well, now we can work together, and we'll go fight." You know, so they couldn't even be bothered to explain why they should wait. You know, they just said, "No, <laughs> said, do not pass." Yeah, I mean, they're they're faced with like holy lightning men, and even then, they're like, "Nah, you guys are kind of dumb. Like, not interested." Well, it also was the chamber that Sigmar chose to send because he sent the astral templars, right? Which are literally the most barbaric. Of, of the storm. <laughs> it's like, dude, you are the smartest, coolest, most intelligent people ever. Ever here, I'm going to send you some barbarian stormcast to help you out. So maybe he was trying to like smart. He was trying to smarten him up. Like maybe he was trying to like you could use sorry, some time. Sorry, in Paul, I'm going to have to actually you here, but actually it's the Tempest Lords that he sent. Oh, fail so the, the, <laughs> the 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 aristocrats of the of the uh, of the storm uh, whatever the stormcast. Here's here's the here's the deal, Paven. Whenever Paul just makes something up whole cloth, you just gotta let him go. But, um, but I like this dichotomy, this, this balance. Oh yeah, <laughs> Paul, we're we're twins. <laughs> I'm the idiot one. You're the smart one. This is all great. I like it. You see, there's an ongoing game where our listeners have to identify the made up nonsense that Paul uh, oh, no, has. I've destroyed Mortal Realms drinking game. <laughs> But now I'm looking up the Tempest Lords. Yeah, they are recruited from dynasties of warrior ac- aristocrats that are accustomed to rulership. Cool. Anyways, um, so Age of Sigmar, we're, we're finally sort of in the present. Um, what, is, what does the Age of Sigmar bring uh, for our, our, our plucky band of elves? Um, business as usual? I mean, kind of in some yeah, ways. Yeah, it, overall, it's just the kind of the... It, you know, the forever war that is Warhammer. And it's just uh, mostly just stories of like cool things that happen during those battles. 
Um, well, one of the stories I thought was cool is, uh, you have it noted here, is an arrow in a gale, where it talks about how one of the wind spirits, Elementari, uh, manifests itself to to take down an, uh, you know, this powerful demon. So it, it was a neat representation where, again, some of these, these elemental creatures can, can manifest physically and contribute, don't necessarily have to work through or be summoned by uh, the Elementari temples or, or casters, so to speak. Yeah, and if I'm going to jump on, well, they were fighting specifically a flying, uh, like flock of of the Zinchian flyers. What are they called again? I, I forget. But uh, the screamers, yes, yeah, screamers. It was like a flock of screamers, and then the the, the twins, the scribes, the, yeah, yeah. The, the blue scribes riding, and they were specifically fighting against that, which is like a cool visual. Um, but I, what I really liked about the story is it kind of teased miniatures that don't exist. So we I, we, we haven't talked about this, but the only there's four elementary temples mentioned in the book and we only have miniatures for one of them which is the mountain temple um and so this was actually a, disc- a, a, a prose description of what a uh a wind avatar would look like and they said it was fox-faced and covered in ribbons and flew through the air and used a large bow which sounds like a really cool model and there's also i think long-limbed riding beasts Ooh. yep and uh, i also see a quote here is cloud riding mages of the temples so um, I don't know if that's uh, a teaser of things to come, but I always like kind of like when there's gaps that we can start filling out. So that's one of them. Yeah. Well, and my favorite story um, from the Age of Sigmar was actually the, the Battle of the Simulacra. So we'll get in a little bit into the, uh, the realm of, or the Iliatha. Uh, but suffice to say that there are... Lumineth realm lords that are able to clone themselves, but they're still still who they are, um, and they have this connection. So they're, the realm, the Battle of the Simulacra is basically this hole opens up where just a monstrous amount of flamers come through, and as they are fighting off the flamers, they realize that they are regenerating in the realm of chaos. And so what they do is they send in one of the clones, or one of the two sets of clones, multiple of them to fight one in the age of in the realm of chaos and one in the realm of hish so that when the realm of hish kills one the actual realm of chaos twin can see exactly which one was killed and then can kill that exact same one and that breaks the spell so they end up winning the battle but unfortunately one of the clones is still trapped in the realm of chaos and cannot escape and because they are linked, because they are clones, we have this one who theoretically is going to go insane, along with the one that is in Hish and completely sane and completely safe. So there's a really interesting um, question as to what's going to happen with those clones. As we all know, uh, in re- for, like in real life twins, um, that whenever one feels, the other is going to feel automatically. So like that is a, a very terrible existence for the, the clone that's still on yeah, the hish nice. side. Yeah. Everyone knows that. Yeah, I was going to say that, that it, from the, the reading, it didn't really sound like they were physical clones per se, but their souls were bound. Like they were twin souls, but different different bodies different parents so to speak which i thought was interesting you know but as a result of a lot of the cloning magic and technologies that that particular um realm uh practiced in the age of myth would you say that they were soul bound yeah that was a, a delightful story is this remind me is this the one where there's the shadow demons is it- the gift of say are is the shadow demons yep so i mean we we have to talk yeah, about it right take it away there's this gift to Sayar, Sayar, um, where I don't even remember the point of the story because I was so distracted by the the reveal. But there was some okay. So there, uh, so a delegation goes to Ulgu for some reason, diplomatic mission, um, and they have a really kind of uh, VIP, uh, which is a well <laughs> well liked um, master of the elementary temple of the zenith. Um, who's not answering his pager anymore. Um, or, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his magical summon, and they're like, oh, this is real bad news, because this guy, if he ever gets into trouble, he just pops into the sky. Like, he literally turns into a beam of light and then waits for it to be over. And, yeah, like, who would have messed this guy up? And so um, they send people after him. And uh, is this where you want to take it away, Aaron? 
Well, it just it, it turns out, or that the as it the folks who ch- who chase him down, or they were beset by uh, a number of shadow demons in the employ or control of Malarion. There's so much to unpack there. First of all, what's a shadow demon? Second of all, what's Malarian's deal? Like up until this point, he's been relatively cool. What is he doing attacking people for? Especially a, a uh, like a diplomatic delegation. Like of all of all folks, why would he be he's swinging at them? Um, what is the story here? And what does a shadow demon look like? Actually, more importantly, what is a shadow demon? Um, mm-hmm. Well, the shadow demon, shadow kin, are the creatures that Malarian first encountered when he came to Ulga. Oh. And he learned, learned the ways of shadow by well manifesting himself, but also interacting with them. So I so. I didn't I didn't know that tidbit, but I had to put the book down when that happened um, and take a screenshot of it and share it to everybody I knew. Um, is what's the story there? So one of the best parts of these battle tones, right, is where they give you a glimpse of the future. I'm um, talking about like that wind elemental. Like that's one example of things that we don't know but could possibly exist. The right. shadow demons are another. Yeah, and I thought it was uh, a. Interesting too is when he gets rescued, he, he decides not to make a big deal of it because they want to maintain relations. Don't want to create a diplomatic incident. So, uh, so there's a lot of political uh, sub sub language going on in the background there. I think. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm trying to look and I'm failing to find um, which realm were they in when this ambush happened. They were in Ulgu. They were the delegation was sent to Olgu, uh, and then uh, this guy, his name, the good-natured ambassador Kalinstral of Now, uh, fails to answer his magical summons, and then they send another group after him, and that that group gets ambushed by the shadow demons officially, um, and then they all of their trinkets and kind of gifts were were stolen. These are the things they were going to trade for this uh, mystic. Um, and then when they're in the cave, the mystic is bound in chains of shadow, which keeps him from bamfing out of there. Um, and then he te- he like kind of tells them about it in an old kind of fable style way. And then they fight over like the really important one. And then it explodes into beams of light, kills all the shadow demons. And the monk is able to escape into the heavens. One more thing that they, they, we, we, uh, telling us about cool things that don't have miniatures is the, is this, um, elementary uh temple master of the zenith who has kind of these uh light powers i guess yeah well and the little trinket that explodes is described as a model of the realms themselves right which to me really sounds like a miniature enlightenment engine which is the thing because if you look at the engine itself it has these little things that are twisting about and throughout um And so I I thought that was an interesting little detail that connected to a miniature, at least in my head. So I thought that was cool. If we're talking about timeline stuff, maybe that's worth bringing up, um, is that one one of the most recent techless things, I guess, that we've experienced in the Age of Sigmar, right, is is the creation of these Enlightenment engines and their their, uh, gifting over to Sigmar. But like I don't n- remember it ever being addressed in this book whatsoever. Nope, it's nope. not mentioned. Nope, not at all. Kind of a, a it's it's odd. Normally, I feel like battle tones like this are will give at least a passing reference to some of the other like larger plot points that we're aware of. But this book never really takes the time. Interesting, I would say. It's so beneath them. It was just a minor minor trifle. It, it was yeah. It was they were. It was like the equivalent of giving. It was just like they're donating it to give goodwill. Like they had yep. no interest in it anymore. Exactly. Um, so uh, we're in the Age of Sigmar. You, any other Age of Sigmar stuff you guys want to talk about? I want to talk about the Lance of Light because this isn't uh, necessarily very, uh, you know, isn't ground shaking, doesn't tell us anything new about the realms, but I think it's a really fun story. So um, I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do the, the abridged version here. But um, so a, uh, so a, <laughs> maybe I'll just read part of it. And so it's Trill Hallian, a precocious, Zaitreki mage of no more than 19 summers old steals an orb of translocation from his tutors during a long plan of ice. Then he uses that, uh, that orb to sneak into his, uh, his dad's office and take the fabled lance of light off the shelf. And as soon as he does, it activates and then it shoots through the office, through the, the town. It, shoots, it, it hits a wagon, breaks it apart, kills a bunch of gargants that are like attacking that wagon, Goes through the goes through a mountain, knocks over a statue of Tyrion, and then shoots off the edge of the world. 
Um, and then of, uh, right after which uh, our, our, our hero, Trillhalian, just puts it right back on the shelf and leaves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, w- whistling as he goes, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> this was probably a story that was, to my mind, the, the most shared story like on Twitter for a while. Was, was, I mean, there's all sorts of little juicy lore tidbits, but yet this is the one that grabbed like the imagination of so many people. Because um, yeah, yeah. it's delightful. Yeah. How powerful that particular artifact was. Oh, yeah, they're just hanging out in the study. <laughs> yeah, well, and and despite the enlightenment of this race, like I mean, they still have adolescence or like you know yeah, right. immature like children, right? And they still do immature children stuff. So I don't care how fancy your elves are, they're still uh, getting into trouble. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so it was uh, a pleasure, and it's you know you love the the humor that's peppered uh, throughout, especially in a what could be considered a pretty serious battle tone like this. These um, Lumineth don't leave a lot of room for. Uh, levity, despite kicking it with the wind and the zenith. See, that's a levity joke. Um, it uh, they uh, for the most part they stay they stay grounded. Yeah, stay very grounded. Ah, good <laughs> job. Yeah, Josh is playing too. Um, and uh, so to have an opportunity to s- see the lighter side. Um, <laughs> yeah, lighter side. Uh, uh, was, was 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 worthwhile. Yeah. Um, one other question I'll have is how does the, uh, what is it called? The Arcanum Optimar, or that is to say the post Necroquake, um, how does that affect our, our uh, boys in white um, in, in Hish? Does it have, you would imagine it would have some effect, especially being so magically focused, this, this race. Um, how do they have to handle it? Yeah, it was actually very interesting because uh, it alludes to Hish being a realm of symbols. And so they get lots of symbols just like you know the rest of the realms did but they're more pronounced or, or they take the message like oh yeah something's happening in shaish it's gonna be bad and so teclas actually directs all the elementary and other and other lumineth to build these towers of crystal aether quartz to help mitigate whatever might be coming and so it, it helps kind of manage the damage that that uh, hish gets from the Necroquake, but they do get a run, you know, of uh, uh, the spells the slipping out of my brain here with the, with the uh, living, living spells, you know, to run amok throughout Hish. Remind me, I feel like I remember reading this, but I can't remember what the, this is a legitimate question, I can't remember. Um, there, you guys remember right before the Necroquake when, like, all the different armies were sort of arrayed outside Nagash's door trying to stop whatever they, they didn't know what it was going to be, but they were trying to stop whatever his big plan was. There was a reason why the Lumineth weren't there. And I can't remember what it was, but they, they did talk about it. Didn't they? Yep. Yeah. He essentially Teclis saw where it was all happening and he said, okay, they got it handled. I'm going to focus on preserving Hish. And so they worked on building the towers of crystal. Um, cool move. Teclis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and again. Then they, and then when they failed, Teclis was like, Oh crap. I can't just sit here and do nothing. Like this, this whole like the dead rising in Hish is really not a good thing, right? I I actually have to go out and help with this fight because they're not going to win without us. Basically, he's just like, oh yeah, they've been standing here doing nothing, but like we're so good that we're the only reason that they're actually going to win this fight. So I guess we better go help them because they're useless yeah. to us. Yeah, and if reality falls apart because we're not out there, then it does us no good. Yeah, so. You guys have prompted a very delightful segue into, um, I guess, maybe modern times or like the current timeline. So, like, we've talked a lot about how the the realm lords are are more than happy just to sit pretty in in Hish. But as we now know, with the release sort of the army, um, they are going to start spending a little bit of time uh, in those other realms. Like, why? How? What? Like, what's 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 the mentality? What's the process? Uh, what are they What are they about these days in the sort of present present day? Well. So one of the examples that they've actually fleshed out relatively well um, is that the Lumineth are in the mountains of Halost in the realm of Shayish um, because they are communing with the mountains in the realm of the dead. Um, so they are starting to make these outposts and starting to put these temples, these elementary, um, with more than just Hish. And they're, you know, like for all intents and purposes, declaring this land holy in addition to Hish, which I, I think is a really cool, interesting way of colonizing or um, moving the race around. Um, I'm sure the people who are being colonized feel the same way. Yeah, this, uh, 
uh, Aaron, to get further at your point, so there's a little foreshadowing here. So after, well, you know, the guy we've already mentioned that um, after the necroquake, you know, Teclis is convinced that they can't just sit in Hish. They need to go out because if the because re- things in other realms can destroy their realm. Um, and explicitly, Teclis cautions, uh, or no, Tyrion ca- uh, cautions Teclis, like, hey, don't go out there and piss everybody off, right? You know how you do. <laughs> um, Teclis got a Teclis. Teclis is unmoved and is going out there and is trying to stabilize the realms, but he's n- not necessarily playing nice with everyone. And he will, you know, they will stabilize the realm and destroy a civilization if they have to. Um, and so that could be foreshadowing of more inter- inter-order slash inter-elf conflict that may be coming in the future. Yep, yep. Preserve reality at any cost, as, you know, mentioned in the in there. Yeah, but it's even, it, yeah, but they're, you know, they're pretty haughty. Like, there's a story in there that I don't know if we're going to talk about, but about um, the, the, the elves uh, closing a rift to the realm of chaos through the middle of a town while everybody's still in it. And they're just like, well, you know, He's like, you, you couldn't have done anything. He's like, the best I could do is nothing. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. This is, or do we have a victory? Yes, there's victory, and then there's victory. <laughs> and and then at one point, like he sees the, the one guy sees the rune. And he's like, what are you? Are you? What are you doing? Are you crazy? And then they just bonk him on the head and knock him unconscious. Um, so lucky dude didn't get killed because uh, things could have gone way worse for him. Uh, yeah. So I don't. They may be making friends, but they're probably not making a lot of friends um, out out in the in the world and then kind of i guess semi-related but th- they also are going to continuously sort of have to keep their eye on the whole Slaness situation right like it's been repeatedly said such that i mean we all know what's going on right like it's only a matter of time before Slaanesh either slips those bonds or, or breaks them wholesale uh and so because of that um there is the constant sort of fear and vigilance that we all know as audience members isn't isn't going to amount to much, and uh, Slanesh, Slanesh probably is going to have to break out at some point. And it's not just us as audience members. It mentions in the book that both Morakithi and Teclis explicitly. Yeah, you're right. Think it's inevitable. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no, you can't chain a god forever, uh, and so we have to prepare for the 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 day when he escapes. Well, and I think it's interesting um, that Morathi thinks that you can't chain a god forever because she's literally holding the heart of a god. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah, and it's her fault. He's getting loose. Exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a justification. Like he's going to break out eventually. So if I break him out, it's not because really of me. Possible. Whoops. <laughs> well, well, maybe she's just pla- she's just planting the seed. That so when he gets out, she's like, "No, guys, it was inevitable. Like there's nothing anybody could have done uh, to have ever stopped it." What if Marathi's looking for a new patron? I mean, that's not impossible, right? Wasn't she? Nor- wasn't didn't she used to be like a Slaneshi kind of kind of gal? Yes, they allied with Slanesh. Well, that'd be crazy. Uh, yeah, it, it could certainly could happen. I think what is w- one thing that is makes Marathi somewhat relatable is that she is like on a quest for vengeance against Slanesh and had such a horrible time inside that that is like, oh, like she, you know, she's she's had it pretty rough. Uh, and if she would like, you know, go back to Slanesh, that'd be a big bummer. But could happen. She'd been there before. <laughs> Love hate relationship. Yeah, ain't that true? Does that 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 catches us up, right? Like this is this is present day. I think we're yeah. we're here. We made it, team. We're about ten um, percent of the way through the episode. Yeah, so <laughs> strap in. Um, we're here. Uh, check the calendar. It's today. Uh, so maybe we we talk about uh, maybe a holistic uh, visual. Uh, uh, um, impression of, of the army as it exists now, and maybe maybe army is the, is the the term I want to use because they are now sort of been honed into a fighting force with their eye cast towards the the realms at large. Um, how how are they organized these days? Like how do what what makes a Lumineth force? How do they work? I'm open to suggestions. Input need input. Um, I think that a good place a good place to start would be the Venari. Right, uh, where Tyrion has organized society into this military force, right? And the Venari are basically like the backbone. Isn't there isn't there a term for like the Tyrion perspective on warfare that like even harken back to the Age of Myth? I think there is. Oh my god, I think I wrote. I think well, I I, I think maybe what you're thinking of. I wrote this down: the decree Tyronic. Ooh, yeah. What does that mean? It, it, it talks about 
it talks about well the Tyrion and Teclis having two different facets of the mirror where Tyrion is very um active, you know, physical prowess, you know, and um and doing things where the, the Teclis side is very reflective logical and they spend a lot of time thinking and making decisions and um, and even the, the continents are divided in those two different perspectives and so this this first force that we see from the lumineth is the teclian side where he has said i need to do something and so what we see are mainly you know forces that are involved with well, actually no they come from the, the different continents as well some of the, the Tyrian continents it looks like but uh but it but it, i think it's one perspective of of the the lumineth forces and we'll definitely see the mirror image or other facets of it as we delve further into the the game and the history so uh the decree tyrannic founds the venari um which uh paul talked about and so there are a group of i think citizen soldiers which is a thread from the old world and the old high elves where they also had a citizen levy with their kind of small numbers um, so these are kind of like the baseline troops that are consistent across the nations. Um, and so these are like pikemen and uh, bowmen and cavalry, kind of in a very traditional kind of setup with a very uh, like kind of laid out martial, uh, both way of making war, but um, kind of very orderly and defined, I guess. And, and not even that mystical. I mean, they are, they are all magic because it's elves, but they're like, um, I don't know, very kind of traditional. With the exception of the fact that I think most, if not all of them, just glow, which kind of st- stands out. Um, you can't just have your mundane dude with a spear, but like, that spear has to glow with the intensity of a thousand suns kind of thing. Um, but yeah, beyond that, they're, they're dudes to stab and shoot and cut with, basically. And so that seems like it, that forms at least the backbone, or maybe some might call it the battle line um, of their army. Um these these citizen citizen shoulders soldiers so the the most n- numerous um, of their uh, of their martial uh, forces but that's not all that wouldn't be enough um, they wouldn't be able to take back Kish if that if that's all they had available to them um, they've got some secret weapons uh, in their in their pocket what 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 else do they have in their arsenal oh, well they've got the uh, the first look at elementary um, you know obviously they have the four different uh, divisions and the first look we get are you know associated with the mountain and the alarith stone mage and the stone guard and the spirits of the mountain you know so these are the elementary essentially a caster that supports the stone guard and can make them you know influence them in the battle and the stone guard are slower tougher you know and, and, and you know described as being able to hit like the mountain and and withstand you know armies and you know not move and that sort of thing and um and and part of that the facet of the elementary is the ability to create these magical avatars of you know made from stone and sunstone and aether quartz and and uh, microcosma of that mountain to house the spirit of that mountain so they could walk into battle alongside the elementary yeah, so we kind of talked about this new way of of thinking and, and and doing things, and this is you know sort of the the manifestation of that on the battlefield, the sort of evolve evolving um, of the general populace. Um, is, are there any similarities or parallels in sort of Lumineth society that's sort of off the the battlefield? That that is to say, how how did how did um, society sort of mirror that how, how, how are they different now that we've sort of reached this um enlightenment stage um because like the, the faction isn't all fighters like uh how, how are how are the lumina different post like spirefall and sort of this age of age of sigmar um well they are not quite the um ether quartz addicts that they were before um i think there's a general understanding that consuming ether quartz at the rate that they were does not lead to good things. Uh, and most of the elementary in particular um, are about detachment from everything. So when you become an elementary, you literally give up everything that you are in order to bind yourself to the mountain or bind yourself to the zenith or, you know, um, it is this intentional letting go. Um, and so I think a lot of it just comes down to realizing that there's only so much that even intelligence and knowledge 
can actually benefit you. And you need to actually pursue everything else going on. And each of the great nations actually kind of has their own way of expressing what that intent is and how to live that out. Um, so it's a, a, it's a fascinating division that's in the Lumineth uh, Realm Lords. It's not even necessarily like in the other uh, battle times that we've talked about, perhaps like the, um, the Seraphon, where it's far more about this is where they are and how they do it. This is for far more of like literally their viewpoint upon how the world operates and how Hish is to be saved, which is a really cool uh, twist on it. Yeah, um, I kind of wish they would spend more time on like, and maybe I just glossed over it, but like um, more time on 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 just living now in like in Hish. And I guess they still sort of talk about how like this um, uh, attunement with the elements is sort of replaced or, or sort of works alongside their their previous sort of Teclean ladder, um, like search for like greatness is just sort of a different different type of greatness and they maybe learn to temper some of their aspirations and, and introduce a bit of humility i think we mentioned before um but i'd love to see how that translates into like day-to-day living and like it left a lot of room i think and i hope hopefully we get to explore more of it in sort of the internal inter-society post-civil war um and, and what that what that ends up looking like are you asking where the vimineth realm lord farmers uh, in some, in some degree. Yeah. In fact, uh, we had a, a question from, from the audience. Uh, I think it was drill. Abbott Harry wanted to know about the luminous social structure, agrarian infrastructure, trans regional cuisine, powerful mercantile houses and transportation related technological breakthroughs. They are exporting to the other realms, man. I almost made it through that whole sentence without hesitating. I, I did really good. Um, and uh, I feel I feel that um, it's rare that we get that in the battle tome. It's very actually uncommon to get most of those things. Um, but this yeah. is this is one that I feel like really would would have been illuminating, perhaps, to mm-hmm. have found out more about. Uh, it, it it really was drawing me in, and I, I would have I would have liked to have known more. Well, I think a little bit. Did you talk about it a little bit um, when they're talking about branding in these these runes into the landscape? They have branded them into Hish as well. And they talk about how, you know, like, it's just somebody farm. And they're like, but this is what we need to do. And people are like, well, crap, you know, like, this is still my farm. And now you've branded this whole thing across the landscape, and you've ruined part of my farmland, right? So it is actually mentioned that this is a thing that they do. They do actually have farmers, um, which is amusing, but also useful for its story. Um, when they're talking about social structure... Uh, one of the interesting things about the Teclean ladder, um, even though they've kind of tried to push away from that a little bit, I felt like, um, if you are a king, but you are lower on the Teclean ladder than a hermit, the hermit can tell you what to do, and you have to do it. Right? There still is this understanding that knowledge is more important than standing. Um, and they're, by that definition, right? if somebody is a king, and they have to obey a hermit, then obviously there is some royalty, some kind of like uh, actual ruling class that is going on. Um, if we're talking about the Liliatha uh, in particular, um, there is a matriarchal structure. Um, as far as trans-regional cuisine, I'm not 100% sure about what that is. Um, and that's not uh, explored. But the powerful mercantile houses... I think we'd have to actually talk about Sayar quite a bit to kind of get where that is going because they talk about making the most beautiful things and how they're at the height of fashion. So I think this question is definitely uh, linked to the four great nations and how they express themselves. Yeah, even though the uh, the Teclean ladder is, is changed somewhat, uh, they do indicate that there's a sort of uh, structure of elementaries. You know, so the river is the most abundant so it has a little less influence than that mountain, which is next. And then above that is wind. And then, of course, zenith at the top. There's the fewest elementary zenith because it's so difficult to do. And so there's some sort of influence, again, kind of in this ladder top down. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly what that is, but it does allude to it. The elemental power of top, of, of peak. Um, so, yeah, that's any, any other thoughts about sort of the internal... Uh, day-to-day living um of these folks 
because the next step would be sort of how they live uh, or interact with the world at large or the mortal realms at large. But I feel like we kind of already touched on that a little bit, talking about how they're burning runes. Um, they're, they're tasked with protecting reality because it, it, it's going to end up benefiting Hish. So they, they're sort of obligated to go out and sort of help uh, the world. Um, are there any other thoughts about how they interact with the realms at large or who their possible specific enemies or allies might be, if anybody wants to talk about, about any of that stuff? There's... um. One snippet, and I can't remember if it was in the Battle Tome or if it's like one of those posters that get released on the Warhammer community site, but it, it talks about uh, Hish or, you know, maybe merchants from Hish selling um, spent Aether Quartz. So it has the emotions in it and not the knowledge, you know. So I don't know if that's something that the, the elves are doing or if that's just something that the humans are saying, oh, yeah, I could make a buck with these spent <laughs> Aether Quartz and continue to pass that along. So I think. Part of the important thing about the Lumineth Realm Lords is that even when they do, quote, cooperate with other armies, other races, right, they're not actually cooperating. They're just doing their own thing, and somebody else might just happen to have the same goal, right? They are always considering themselves to be smarter, better, more intelligent, more prepared, um, and the correct way to handle every situation, Um that's definitely represented on the tabletop by the fact that the only people that they will actually ally with is the item. Um, but the other thing is that because they do see themselves as the perfection, the only thing they fear is their own failures. And so that's, I think why Slanesh is considered such an enemy to them because they see falling to Slanesh. Not only the spire fall was their own fault, right? But, if they were to fall to Slanesh, it would be their own fault as well, right? Nobody else can actually make them do things that are not helpful or not useful. It's literally down to, no, we can only do this to ourselves. The greatest enemy was themselves all along. Um, you talked about, you had mentioned the deep can and how they're the, the only allies. Um, another listener question was, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, is it severe, Elon? Uh, I'm going to assume that's it. Uh, he was interested in seeing how the Lumineth viewed the Aideneth and vice versa. Uh, he, I suspect there's be, there'd be some friction between the two, but Aideneth are their only allies. We sort of talked about this in the Discord a little bit, but uh, there's the passing reference that the Deepkin were sort of the first souls plucked from Slanesh, and then really never really referenced again, which is wild to me because it seems like that is ripe for drama, right? Like imagine being a Deepkin and scoping out these Lumineth um, knowing that they were, they are, you know, daddy's chosen, daddy's favorite. Right, right. Well, Teclis is favorite. Tyrion saved them from destruction. So, oh, you know, that's, that's true. So there might be a, you know, they, okay, Teclis is not so nice to us, but Tyrion, maybe he, you know, maybe he'll help us. I don't know. The, the bar of not killing all of us is not very yes. high. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was weird, and I don't, I think our uh, listener brought that up that it was like weird that they're allies. Right, like they they shouldn't like the Lumineth have no allies except for the Aidneth. Um, you know, and they do have like they're the most similar culturally. Like they do have the same touch points, and they are like uh, they do letters. Like, I think they could like talk to each other, and they would understand each other. But um, yeah, it, it, I would love. I can't wait for that to be explored more, possibly in future publications. I mean, I, it, it it would just have to be, right? Like, it's, it's such a prime thread to be tugged to see, like, uh, the direction that they're going. Um, and it's also no, interesting to me to think that, like, if you look at the Ideneth, they have a few um, sort of cultural callbacks to, and I guess the Lumineth do too, but, like, they, they seem to, like, venerate some of the old High Elfian, is that a word? Uh, um, Gods. Yeah, God, yeah. Well, it, that, that's what I'm thinking of, specifically, like Mathlan, but, like, they, they, they have that callback. And to some degree, the Lumineth don't. And it's weird to me that, like, the Lumineth are so much more aesthetically and maybe more directly related to those those High Elves. Um, with the exception of the Light of Aetherion, maybe is a pretty stark or pretty clear um, High Elf reference. They both, like, when these r- races were creative, uh, Tyrion and Teclis had the old High Elves in- held in their mind. And both the... Lumineth and the Eidneth were like taught the legends and the myths and the stories of ancient uh, Yulthian um, too, so they could try to replicate these cultures because these are the kind of the I think the, the the pinnacle of what like a perfect society was in these 
in Teclis's mind. Um, so like both the Lumineth, like, uh, and well, like the loom, they tried to like organize themselves and like become these thing they wanted to be. Um, and so that's why you have these eel riders in the Eidneth, which are kind of twisted perversions of the old like silver helms or that were part of the old high elf range that they are, they're trying to be this thing like Eidneth can't really do it, but the Lumineth are much closer, like rank spearmen, like uh, ranked archers, like having these all, all these horse lords, like. Yeah, that's that's straight up old high up stuff. Like they are able to replicate this kind of cultural uh, history or myth. And it's kind of cool, at least to my mind, that like the uh, Tyrion and Teclis were the only gods who who seem to try to do that, try to accomplish that. If you if you look at like Sigmar, he doesn't really seem to try to retain any of like that old world like style. Like Alariel doesn't really necessarily do that either. Um, it's it, it's really. Uh, to me, it feels like it's a uniquely Tyrion and Teclis thing to try and recast some of that um, old world stuff into the the, the present day, uh, and maybe more will come of it eventually. But I think it's a good point because like the other gods like come good close ish, um, like they get like they rhyme. You know, I think like the society, the Age of Mist society that Olariel had had Wanderers and Sylvaneth in it. It was probably nice, um, but like Teclis and Tyrion are like we just want the same thing again give us the same one. Like, we'll just, we'll get there and we'll figure it out. Um, and so it seems like kind of very, you know, kind of a very obsessive kind of thing to do. Yep. Yep. And are forced to change, but, but have some consistency too. I've got a hot take. You want to hear my hot take? I can't wait. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, my hot take is that the Idenef connection is going to be fully fleshed out when we get the river temple. Hmm. Oh, right. we've got yeah. elves that are water. <laughs> They're both wet. Elves that are water. Um, and I think there's going to be a much stronger tie. And we're going to see some actual, like, intentional connection at that point. So you so you yeah. think they're going to be tied together? Yeah, you got it. You, you, uh, <laughs> you fjorded that, uh, that huge gap for this, me. Thank you. This is, le- <laughs> this is less fun because you can't see my face. <laughs> I can hear it though. I, I can hear it. Oh, and I want to be clear. I'm saying yuck, yuck, not as like a laugh, but as like saying yuck twice. Yeah, it was literally <laughs> a yucky thing. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So, uh, friends, enemies, enemies, friends, friends becoming enemies, enemies becoming friends. Um, I just, yeah, I mean, there's certainly tension between all the elven factions currently that they've built in. And I think we're about to get like a drop of that more information with the the first broken realms book more athy so can't wait but the table is set but we don't really know what's going to happen i so can't wait um that's that's the thing i'm looking forward to the most i, I mean we just found out about it and it's the, the the highlight of 2020 for me i think um that's not that's not that impressive actually considering how 2020 has gone um so let's let's change gears a little bit and maybe talk about some. We we sort of had brought up some of the units, but I want to hear what your guys' what some of your guys' favorite uh, units are. And by that I mean unit. We don't have time for multiples. Um, did any did any of them grab you? Did anyone uh, grab you and, and shake you and say, "Hey, you must uh, paint me, build me"? Um, what what uh, caught your interest, Paul? I want to know what 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 your fave what your fave is. I really like the light of Eltherion. Um. Eltherion has always been one of my favorite characters from the old High Elves. Um, so he was Eltherion the Grim, and then during Storm of Chaos, we had this blinded Swordmaster miniature for a little while. Um, and then he went back to kind of the way he was before a bit. Um, and this now we have the suit of armor that is embodied by this light that can telepathically communicate with the other Lumineth Realm Lords. Um, and I'm Interested not only because I think it's a really cool entry, but because of the parallel now that we have a blinded Tyria and a um, a being of pure light being Eltherion. So I feel like we've got a little bit of a parallel to the Storm of Chaos Eltherion going on a Tyrion. And one of the really interesting things to me about this whole battle... I'll be battle, the judge of that. that. That's fair. Uh, is that we start off with Tyrion, and then we add Teclis, and then Tyrion is blind before Teclis shows up. So we have this really interesting, I don't know, to me, this really interesting story where 
the person who makes everything happen doesn't show up in the battle tome as a miniature and why the person that is there at the beginning finds his brother like pulls everything out and like really makes this happen saves the nation before Teclas shows up like the person who is active we haven't even actually seen him and we're only seeing the Tekli inside and so I'm I'm really curious as to what the Tyrian miniature is going to be when it comes out and how that's going to be affected, especially because if y'all remember in the old world, Tyrion took up the sword of Cain and was like totally down with Marathi for half of the end times. And I'm wondering how that affected him and how we're going to see that play out. Um, and I'm wondering if he has been drastically changed. And if that's why we didn't see him first, right? Like if Teclas was the relatable one, because he still looks like Teclas, even though he's got this Luna Sphinx, if Tyrion is going to be like, oh crap, what happened, right? Where we, we have Valerian being a fusion of his dragon and himself. Right. What the heck is Tyrion going to be like? Here's here's the deal. You can't, you can't pick a unit that doesn't exist to the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Josh, Josh, what was your, what was your favorite unit? Well, wait, uh, wait, wait, I think, wait, 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 can I say something about the light of Valerian? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you guys know why he is in uh, just a n- not a body? Yes, I was about to say it, but go okay, for go it. On. Josh, tell us the story because that's really cool. And that was tied back to the, <laughs> the old world. Yeah, I was going to say the, the the really interesting thing is because in the end times, Archon the Black cursed him, and his body, you know, disappeared. It, you know, uh, disintegrated, and apparently that curse carries over even in his god form or in, in his recombined soul and um and so every time that the body has been created for the soul it instantly disintegrates and so and apparently teclas continues to try but but he is still cursed by archon the black even even as his soul has been tainted so to speak okay i wasn't gonna chime in but i will two things one um so are, are there multiple <laughs> lights of eltharians is there more than one no there's so, only one so he's a unique that's a unique character yes Oh, okay. I thought you could have more than one. Uh, sec. Well, no. There's more. I got more than one thing. Um, two. Eltharian's the dude with the the Griffin, right? Correct. Eltharian. Yeah. Okay. The gotcha. Lord of Like Storm something, Stormwing, Storm something. I can't remember what it is. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyways. Uh, third thing. I mean, so we're setting ourselves up for a sweet uh showdown, right? Like Moral Realms. Uh, uh second round Eltharian versus Arcan, right? Like they're both here, so like there, there's no reason why they wouldn't. <laughs> Uh, it's only a matter of time. I can't wait to see it. All right. All right. Josh, I want to know what your favorite unit is, and I hope it wasn't the Light of Ultharian. It wasn't. No, no. So Alvinar, the Stoneheart King, I think is my favorite. And it's just because it talks about how these avatars of the spirits of the mountain are created. And uh, Alvinar, the, the tallest mountain in, in Eumetrica, and I think in the entire Hish, um, this Stoneheart King just felt the purpose of the, of the Lumineth and it, it formed itself. Nobody knows how it came to be, where it just showed up and said, I'm coming with you. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Like a lost puppy. Like, no, what what are you doing? Yeah, it's like it spontaneously manifested. And it was like, dude, this is what we do now. And the Lumineth Realm Lord's like, oh, apparently this is how we get spirits of the mountain, is we make a shape <laughs> that looks like the Stoneheart King. And then right, right. this, this uh, whole process, and then the spirit, if it likes the body, will come and occupy the body itself. Cool. Let's just do that now. Actually, I've got a question. What, yeah. what came first, the Stoneheart King, or like, or this the other Al- Alareth spirit of the mountains? Like, did he? Did it doesn't he, really. Does tell he predate us. him? Because that would be awfully convenient that he spontaneously generated the body that looked exactly the same as every other spirit of the mountain. Like, yeah, you couldn't have done anything I, I different. Call that Avalonora showed up first. Okay. They started building the the avatars after that when they were like, "Oh, this is how we do it, right?" This, this is how, how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> Paven, we'll get to you in just a second. Tuesday, nah. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, that, guys. Have fun. Have Paven, fun just a second. No, but uh, it, speaking of the of just the general spirit of the mountains, um, Excalibur Nick was asking, um, "Is there info about the spirits of the mountain appearance in the battle tome?" Um, he hadn't finished reading the book yet, but he was really curious about their composition overall. Um, 
it seemed like there was a body built by Lumineth for the spirit. So just for the sake of our listeners, so h- how are these spirits of the mountain created if you're not the Stoneheart King? Stoneheart King? Apparently there's this, you, you use stone from around the mountain that's got a high concentration of aether quartz. But, um, but they also, like, they give it sun metal armor and it's, you know, highly, highly resistant, very powerful armor. And they also incorporate microcosm of that particular mountain. They make the, the peak look identical to that mountain. And they have plants and substances that grow around that mountain on the avatar. And, uh, and they include these little bonsai looking trees and, and try to make it look as close to that mountain as possible and have elements from that mountain to encourage the spirit to incorporate it. Oh, cool. And so he was wondering, like, if that's the case, why would there be like real life fur and hooves and hands and things if it was purely a construct? And I think it was just maybe an aesthetic choice. I don't, they don't really talk about as to like why they have like, I think it's magic. Yeah. Yeah. A wizard did it. Uh, They also talk about the fact that the, uh, the reason why they have this like yak slash bull motif is because there is this animal that lives on the mountain that is immortal. Right, uh, and it can be killed, but it don't. It, it doesn't die on its own, and so this this uh, yak, for want of a better word, um, actually is represented as the stillness, the peace, uh, the longevity, and and the stability of the mountain. Oh, that makes sense. Yep. yep. So when Abelinor showed up, like it's not only representing himself as the mountain because he's literally got a scale model of the mountain that he is on his back but then this living immortal body right of the yak that lives on the mountain that people commune with in order to understand what it is like to be on the mountain right it it, it, i mean in the u.s we have mountain goats that literally just like can climb the smallest tiny spaces from birth and just occupy and and this biological niche that no other large animal can occupy whatsoever. So to me, like this was actually a super clear um, translation from something in our world into AOS. And I was like, oh, I totally buy that for sure. So Yeah, right on. All right, Paven, what was your favorite unit? My favorite unit is the Alarith Stone Guard. Um, I don't, I don't love the hats, but overall, I think they're very cool. Um, they kind of harken back to old sword masters, but instead of like swords, they have like big old hammers, and they just use those kind of blunt force weapons, which I wouldn't be traditional elven weapons, but with like kind of a fatness and grace and an intentionality, and the. These are uh, elementary warriors. So they devoted themselves to the temple so they can make themselves hard or as immovable as the rock, as the rock of the mountain, and absorb like kind of the onslaught of their flow, foes and then kind of change stance and then attack pack and, and, and drive their foes back. Um, so it's a, it's a cool representation of these kind of uh, these uh, elemental temple warriors. I like these dudes, not because of themselves, but more like it, it makes you wonder what the other temple like units are going to be. Like, I don't necessarily care for these specifically, but like knowing that they're they're part of a genre of like elemental, like not worshippers, but people who are respected. Monks. Anyways. Yeah, monks. It's just, it, just to see that, like, I, I want to see him complete the set. Like, I like I like knowing that they're, you know, part of a whole, which is it's pretty right. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody asked, but I'll say my faves are actually the Venari Dawn, <laughs> Dawn Riders. Um yeah, the nice. Yeah, I mean, I just such a it's like a clean, like concise and sort of simple. I mean, it's not. It's it's incredibly detailed the the, the models, but like at the same time, it's a very simple concept. Um, I think what we're seeing here in this in this Lumineth range is a lot of like high fantasy, fantastical high elves turned up to eleven kind of thing. But like the Venari Dawn Dawn Riders are classic in a way, and 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 uh, kind of grounded. Um, in, in some sense, but still with a lot of like fancy frills that really make, you know, your, your classic cavalry, um, still interesting. Um, it, it really, it, it seems to straddle that line, um, very well for me. So additionally, and kind of along the same lines and sort of the, I don't want to use the word mundane because I'm sure they're magical light generating fighters as well, but, uh, it's one of the few times they actually see horses in the mortal realms. Um, like 
they're still part of like some of the old classic old world kits, just sort of just remnants of that. Um, but it's like the first new horse model. Like we're, we're getting thrown crazy outlandish creatures that, you know, the Stormcast are riding, right? Or everyone's, I mean, people are riding on eels and floating turtles and all sorts of nonsense. <laughs> Sometimes a dude just wants a horse and, um, these are, I mean, they're beautiful. They're, they're, I think they're gorgeous cavalry models. And I'm, I'm really glad that they were able to find a place for something like this in this over the top, um, um, range. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm digging. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They're awesome models. Here we go. Um, there are sub factions cause every, every army has got a sub faction these days. Let's go quick. We don't need to dive too deep into them, but there's, there's four, four factions that did, did, uh, any of them tickle your, your guys's fancy. Um, catch your attention that uh, you uh, you folks want to talk about first come first serve. Yeah, I'll go first. Yeah, uh, I want to talk. Well, there's two I like, but I want to talk about Zytrek, which is the <laughs> who knows how it's pronounced, uh, which are the wizard one. Um, so these are the the mages, the most mystical, the most aligned with Teclas. Actually, the most aligned with Selenar. They kind of think that is where magic comes from, and Teclas is just kind of his buddy, uh, which is kind of funny. Um, the moon's friend. But I really, but what I really want to use this as a seg- segue to talk about moon factions <laughs> um, because they are closely allied with the moons, uh, specifically Selenar. Um, and man, we have a lot of zoom- moon factions, and wouldn't it be cool if we had a moon war? Uh, so, moon faction roll call, Aaron. I don't know if you want to help me, but uh, I think you. I think uh, you listed the ones I'll that I know of. Maybe so. So certainly, uh, Zytrek uh, from the Luminoth Realm Lords. What do you got? Are you just asking for me to name a moon? Yeah, I thought we could go back and forth in kind of a cute little moon thing. Sure, sure. Okay, I won't steal the obvious one because I feel like you have a stronger connection. Yeah. But there is, there's Lunagast, right? So that's like, a, what is it? An, like an un, like a, a ghost moon? Mad moon. A yeah, mad moon? Yeah, it's, it's well, sub- the, sucks the secrets from people. Oh, yeah, no. it's a secret stealing magic moon. Yeah, definitely a bad guy. Uh, yeah, the Gloomswite Gits have the Bad Moon, which is their their patron, uh, which is specifically mentioned that the uh, Zaytrek really don't like. And then the, they really want to get rid of this, this yucky moon, um, but they can't seem to figure out what it's doing. <laughs> no one um, can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so there is, guys, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just misremembering this, but there's also like a Blood Corn Moon, right? Doesn't like Corgus Cole live on a moon? I think it, yeah, it's, uh, I looked it up. It's the Orb Inferno. Okay, so it's not a moon specifically, but yeah, it's a it's a, it's a celestial orb. <laughs> yep, yep. It's a sphere like all of the these. sky that or that orbit. Yeah. Um. So there's everybody's got a moon apparently. Um. Are there more? Do you know of other moons? Th- that was my exhaustive list. <laughs> sure. uh, one thing about the orb, <laughs> we, we shot a time cannon at it that sent it back in time. Yeah, that's true. That's the um. Oh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're an Ashy. Um, the, pr- the Prismaticon or is powering one of the cannons. Um, oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, that factored into a Soulbound campaign that I was running. Anyways, um, so th- you're we've now reached a, reached a sort of critical mass that it's no longer a coincidence, and it seems like uh. They're, they're building up to some sort of moon related content. I mean, they gotta be right. How are there so many moons? <laughs> if not, we're making one. Yeah. 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 They're really, I mean, they just went back to that moon. Well, a lot. Moon the lunar wars. wars. The lunar yeah, wars. Exactly. It sounds like a, it sounds like a 40 K thing, not a AOS thing. <laughs> um, all right. Other, other sub factions that folks want to talk about. I, I really enjoy the Iliatha. They're the absolute worst, but I'll let you go first. That's fair. Um, so Iliatha are a um, led by a bunch of women who really are like, dude, we're a dying race, right? So this is the opposite of the old world high elves. Whereas the old world high elves were like, dude, we're a dying race. Oh, well, it is what it is. Direct quote. We'll kind of move. Yeah. Um, so this one is, we need to have more kids, more elves more everything right so this is the one that's far more about propagating more of the race and so we have this childbirth is a huge important thing for them right and the people who are the most honored are the women who have had the most children and then we also have this really fascinating high fantasy idea of cloning so you clone yourself right um, and that's where we kind of dive back into that story where the clone was on one side of the age of chaos or the realm of chaos 
in one in the realm of Hish. And so the Iliatha are actually the reason why Slaneth was able to invade, um, because they cloned and cloned and cloned. So instead of just having two, you would have three or four or five. Um, and it says that their experiments actually caused a wrench in reality, which is where Slanesh came in. Um, and that no one will talk about it, right? Anywhere in Hish, everybody's just like, we don't even talk about that. That's not even the thing that we bring up. This is so beyond um, what's going on. It's in but, the past. <laughs> exactly. And the past can't hurt you. Exactly. Um, but some of the interesting things is that even the clones are still elves, right? So there are still clones and original progenitors from the realm of myth running around in Iliatha. Uh, and there's almost a stigma in certain parts of Iliatha that's like, you are the people who killed us, right? You are the ones who doomed our entire race. Um, so that's a really interesting um, take. And we can get some really interesting, I think, narrative hooks when you're talking about that. Uh, but it's just, it's kind of a cool, it's something that we haven't really seen before. And not only is it completely against the old high elf lore, but it also plays in really nicely to the Idenef lore. But all of their children are born with full souls, as opposed to Idenef, where they are born with no souls or half souls. So I just thought that was a really cool um, creation. Let's put it that way. Right on. Yeah, definitely. Josh, we got. Um, I actually liked the the Iliatha too because uh, it was a really interesting concept. But didn't you hear me? I said th- they were the worst. Oh, no, in terms of con- I'm, you know, genetics is one of my you know bachelor degrees. So you know, the whole the cloning and genetic engineering is all. I was like, well, yeah, I get I it. Failed genetics once, and I had to take it a second <laughs> time. <laughs> but uh, but one of the other ones I really enjoyed is the Imetrica, the the mountain. You know, it's got a lot of chasms and mountains, and and of course the first elementary temples were kind of set up here, and um, but you know there's so many mountain temples. It must be this particular part of Hish is, is rendolent in mountains and has the tallest mountain. That uh, you know the the saying Umetra walks is uh, because all the avatars or spirits are walking around with the the rest of the warriors. But uh, but it has a really neat you know descriptions and stories about how you know some of them have to be super strong or. or confident in themselves to explore the chasms that are you know associated with the mountains and that you know and if they come back then they're even wiser than they were when they went to the top of the mountain so there's some really interesting concepts there about your your, your path to enlightenment doesn't always go up but sometimes you have to go deep <laughs> sure 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 that makes sense um the last one uh i wasn't expecting to have to talk about them but let's see what i can i, what I can put together all right so the lessons are the cr 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 um these are the craftsmen, the makers, basically. So we're talking about like sort of the age of myth, myth and how folks were always creating these massive weapons that they totally weren't going to ever use. They were just doing it for the the love of invention, um, and a lot of those ended up being used in sort of sort of the civil wars and the the spire fall. Um, and the sire are, are the folks who, who make the best and most creative and inventive sort of weapons. They're the craftsmen, the tinkerers, but the artisans as well. It's not just necessarily always sort of functional stuff that they're making, but they definitely take um, the artistry of the creation as well um, to, to heart and, and sort of uh, highlight the importance of that, of that stuff. And it's not just weapons or tools, but they're also um, fashionable, right? Like oftentimes they're at the height of fashion, but with that comes a sort of double, a double edged sword or something that they need to treat carefully in that they don't want to get too, they don't want to fall into the same traps that they did um, back prior to the spire fall um, and, you know, find themselves to be too um, haughty or, or um, proud of sort of their creations. And so it's, they create these great things, but they still at the same time need to practice the humility um, that would keep them from being too proud. Uh, they, these days um, they're, uh, still sort of capable of making these great weapons, but they're sort of building on sort of that institutional lo- knowledge that has sort of occurred over time. Um, and uh, if necessary, are able to sort of call back to those great sort of inventions of the past and build upon them uh, moving forward in the future. And oddly enough, that actually was still, that was my favorite. So it was, a, what a coincidence that I was able to talk about them. Yeah, it was interesting because it says their lands are the most ravaged because they did have all those really powerful artifacts and weapons. 
uh, and apparently they still have some of them buried in the ground. Um, some folks are probably will probably ask, so I'll, I'll just bring up the reason that I don't necessarily care for the Iliatha is that I think what makes a good subfaction as we sort of talk about all these different armies in their in their battle tomes is they take a faction and it highlights either one of two things basically one it it takes us a core component of the army and sort of expands it and really focuses in on that particular thing um, of the faction Um, or i think a good one also is if you take that faction and move it to a different realm where it doesn't necessarily come from but show how that realm has affected or morphed or modified that faction to sort of sort of that they can be sort of utilize the realm that they're living in, um, I think is also a really cool way that they make these sub factions. Um, and although you can make the argument that twinning hashtag twinning is a, a vital component of the luminous, I don't know that that's necessarily true. Like sure. I know the gods are twins, but like to then try to highlight that as one of the core components of the army. There's so many more interesting things that the army does that you could really like focus in and exaggerate in a faction. Um, <laughs> twinning wasn't one that, personally like grabbed me um it seems like it seems like there was other things they could have done instead of the twins and clones ugh, clones have been done <laughs> they're not really clones anymore they're they're own souls. soul soul twins um they're, they're soul twins i know we don't yes. normally get negative on this show um but hey it's a new world uh season two i guess of the of the story phase <laughs> uh get ready for it 2020 has done me in um <laughs> I'm, I'm going to push back because I don't think that this point of this is actually twinning. I don't think the point of the subfaction is the twinning thing. You have to say hashtag twinning. Hashtag twinning. Sorry. My apologies. I will do that in the future. The point of the subfaction is not the hashtag twinning. The point of the subfaction to me is you are so confident in yourself that the only thing that can help you be better is another one of yourself. You can't even trust anyone else. Right. I think that's actually the point and the lore behind this subfaction is that they are so haughty. They can't even imagine another member of their race being as useful as another one of them themselves. Okay. Cool. Uh, point taken. Um, are there any additional points of interest? All, all bets are off. Um, everything's, everything's, um, on the table, other points of interest you guys want to chat about, things that grabbed you in this battle tome that didn't fit into our previous topics of discussion. Yes, yes, yes. I want to talk about the Tyrionic regions. So we have the ten paradises. Uh, one is the middle one, that's humans. One is the outside one, which is for nobody, which is the crazy one. And then we have the four Teclasian and the four Tyr- Tyrionic. And we have the rules for the four uh, regions, nations that are aligned with Teclas. We have them in this book. We just went over all of them. There's also a mirror side, a twin side that has the kind of the ones that are more relation that have the military, the sun, the insight, the brightness, um, kind of a, a left brain stuff. Um, and so those are, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce all these, but we have four more regions. What are they? I want to hear about them. They're probably pretty cool. Um, so those are, those are, out there to be explored at a later date. Do we think these are the like the angelic elves that were s- s- subtracted from Slanesh? I couldn't think of another S word. If I was going to guess miniature wise, it's still going to they're still going to share Venari units and Elementari units because those exist in all regions. It's just going to be we'll probably get um, m- like we don't have a non character melee hero as part of uh, this Lumineth release, those would be, would fit right in with like kind of a Tyrion, more military focused army. Yep. And we do have the three elementary that we have not seen any units for and whether they throw all of those into the Tyrionic release or if they spread that out somehow, that would be interesting to see. But, uh, but they did mention that kind of ties into, you know, in the book, they talk about having charioteers and artillery specialists and scouts. And, and again, those are, unit types that we don't have currently so it'll be interesting to see where those fit in and what they look like yeah absolutely um i love i mean i always talk about the anytime we talk about a belt on my this always brings this up but i can't wait to see what the next thing is you know what i'm done i'm done with these dudes uh expand it uh, give, give me phase two phase three i want to know what the expanded uh, lumineth realm lords universe looks like other points of interest keep them coming don't stop well i'm gonna point out that the fourth page of the book, right, um, it describes 
the Lumineth Realm Lords as... Give me a second here. The Realm Lords, Lumineth call themselves for their mastery of the lands of the rival. These numinous beings, the elven scions of the twin gods of Tyrion and Teclis, have scintillating magic in their blood. Right? They have dwelt long in the hush, the realm of light, where enlightenment and skill saturates the very air. The... Lumineth have absorbed so much of this innate potential that when at war they glow with lambent power. To face their war host in battle is to face a barrage of magic, a forest of blades, a crashing assault of elemental wrath. If I were to read that passage before I saw miniatures, I would assume they were talking about angelic elves, right? Numinous is having a strong religious or spiritual quality, indicating or suggesting the presence of a divinity. I think somebody saw some of this, and that's where we got the idea of angelic elves coming from. And if you read the rest of the lore in the Battle Tome, it talks about how they shine, how they, you know, they are the light of the realm. So I don't actually think we're getting angelic, angelic elves, elves because these are the angelic elves that somebody heard about. Yeah, one of the stories actually talks about the human perspective of them and how they thought they were you know, that they ran away in fear because they thought they were angelic beings of some sort. Interesting. Yeah, that could work. That that makes sense to me. They are literally the beings of light. Well, I want to call back to a previous thing that, so there still is, I think, a little door open for angelic elves because, yeah, when they talk about removing the souls from Slaanesh, uh, they, so they, they they remove the Eidneth, but then they remove other groups of elven souls who are saved from within Shadesh, ranging in appearance from the monstrous to the angelic. So we might still have literally angel, uh, angel-winged angel elves that are separate even from the Lumineth. So all, all doors remain open. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, other thoughts? That door for thoughts is still open. Because if not, I'm going to jump into listener questions. Here I go. Let's do it. Let's do it for the Can't fans. Can't stop me. All right. So, um, Coyote, actually, we kind of just touched on this. I'm sorry. I should have brought your name up first. But he wanted. He was asking, I would love to know uh, what you guys think about the Teclian or Tyrionic division between the Lumineth and whether future releases will see more revealed about Tyrion and his role for the faction. I wanted to read that whole question to give you credit for the question, but I think we probably just talked about it. So, refer to the above. Um, Drill Abbott Harry, though, another one, he... Uh, um, had asked that question about the social structures of the Lumineth, but he also wanted to know how, how the Lumineth were represented in Warcry. And normally I would say, well, I don't know. I don't, I'm not an expert in uh, Warcry, but fortunately I have two uh, masters of, of the Warcry uh, universe on this very podcast. I haven't listened to your last Dogs of Warcry episode. I don't know if you referenced the Lumineth at all, but if you haven't, what do you know about it so far? Give me a, a sneak preview. Yeah, we we did discuss it briefly, but not in depth. And um, we could say that it mirrors this release. Obviously, it uses all the same units. Um, one of the interesting things that Pavement had pointed out is that the leaders in the Warcry Warband are actually heroes. And typically, we've seen heroes as allies um, in in the previous releases. So obviously, that that also suggests that when the Tyrionic units come out that we should end up seeing some other Lumineth warbands associated with those units. So, But it, it looks like a good mix of units and, and uh, should be a lot of fun to play. Yeah, I think like, like Warcry is always a good way to get into an Age of Sigmar army. I think the Lumineth rules are uh, no, no exception there. And it does tie into a lot of the lore we talk about. Like what, with Warcry, you're always like, what is this faction doing in the Ape? Um, and so specifically, one of the things we talked about is that Lumineth created all these artifacts of destru- destruction and now are trying to, you know, diffuse them all and or get rid of them. And one of these artifacts has escaped Hish and made it to the eight points. And so they've sent a delegation or a, a small command squad to the eight points to hunt down this artifact and recapture it uh, before, you know, the forces of eight chaos figure out how it works and can, you know, uh, wreak untold havoc upon the realms. Yep, exactly. Very cool. Very cool indeed. There you have it, folks. You don't have to listen to the most recent Dogs of Warcry episode. <laughs> we've, we've, we've covered it here. Um, and so that uh, is 
the questions that we received um, for this episode. I think I caught some people off guard. Folks weren't expecting a, a, a new Moral Realm story phase to drop. But if in the future you yourself wanted to get some questions on the show, what you've got to do, it's very simple, is you need to uh, become a member of the Mortal Realms Discord at www.themortalrealms.com slash Discord. And then you need to sit there all day, every day, just waiting for me to randomly, with no prompt whatsoever, ask the day of recording if anybody has any questions that they want to ask. And if you're there at the right time in the right place, uh, you can ask a question and we'll talk about it here. It's very scientific. Um, so that wraps up those questions. Uh, one of the last questions I'll ask before we get into our maybe review and highlights is not questions, but points is, are there any black library examples for folks who want to um, expand their horizons on, on this army. Um, where would they get some juicy uh, story-based information um, delivered by Black Library? Where, where would they find that? Does anybody have any thoughts? The answer is simple. There's only one answer. Aha! It's Realm Lords by Dale Lucas. So if I understand correctly, you haven't, you haven't finished it. I, I've just started myself. But um, from where you're at, do you find that is a good representation of what we sort of read here in the Battle Tome? Do they, do they gel? Do they mesh? Yes. Cool. Glad to hear it. <laughs> um, I'm going to, the, the way we always close it out, does anybody have, it's a review. It's a weird thing to review because it's not really a, a novel. Like it's hard to like review the prose, but um, final thoughts. Everybody's got to give a final thought before we wrap this thing up. Um, we'll go in order. Paul, you got to go first. Show them how it's done. So I would have to say that I really enjoyed this battle tone, um, especially for giving new content about a race that we've not heard about before. Um, compared to the OCR Bone Reapers battle film, which was far more of a personal history of Catacros, this felt a lot more far-ranging, and it, it filled out the universe of uh, of the Lumineth, and particularly of Hish, like, I would say at least 50% full. Um, so that, that was a really good accomplishment, and I feel like I have a, a pretty good handle on the Teclian sphere of Hish. So that was probably a lot more than I was expecting to get out of reading the Battle Tome for an army that only has 10 units. So I think it was very successful. Um, and I think it fits in well with some of the other um, lore that we've seen in some of the other Battle Tomes. And like you said, it seems like an understandable reason why we haven't seen them before and why they would choose to show themselves now. Cool, right on. Uh, I believe Josh is next. Hit me up, dude. Yeah. Paul summarized it very nicely. And uh, so I'll, I'll just add that uh, I, too, was was uh, pleased. You know, that has got a very deep lore section and a lot of information about the Lumineth and, and Hish in general. Um, and I, I think that the tie-in to the elemental spirits of the realm was a really neat uh, involvement. You know, because you know, we have spirits in and Gairan, you know, but they're, they're kind of earth spirits and, and with Ilariel. And this is a whole different aspect to that where it's, it's the realm itself. And I thought that was a really neat, um, I don't know, but what the best way word for that is, but I, a concept to, to have incorporated into a faction like that. And, and the fact that, that, you know, they have aspects of the previous elves, you know, all the, you know, the faults that, that had the previous elves had before, but, They've changed and they've grown and they've learned from their mistakes and are evolving to something differently, even though they still have some of those faults going forward. Right on. Cool. Pavin, what do you got? Um, okay. So my thoughts on the Battle Tome, it did a lot of work. I think Paul mentioned like how much work this did for Hish, how much it did for the elves, it did for the, the elven gods we've known about since the beginning. Like All of these threads we've known about, they've just been holes, and it really filled, filled up that gap. Now I'm super excited now that like all of the scaffolding is placed to drill down in these places. Um, specifically, I'm excited for seeing how the Lumineth interact with other members of the Order Pantheon, or the Order Alliance. Um, like what's going on in the center of Hish? Like that seems like a real melting pot of different cultures. Um, what's, you know, how they interact with storm hosts? Are they storm keeps getting put up? Like where's the, where are the different lines of tension? So that's it. Finn, period. Um, right on. So uh, from my review, man, I literally just said I knew it was coming. Um, you, you guys basically, it's, it's hard to go last because you guys have said a, a lot of the things 
yeah, said everything. You said a yeah, lot of yeah. things that we're saying. Um, it, it's you can you can envision a scenario if you're GW, you just look at this range and try to decide. All right, so we've got high elves. What do we do different? Like, how how do we respect the past but at the same time move forward? What's the direction we go that fundamentally changes these things and, and makes them uniquely Age of Sigmar? Um, you know, elves basically. And so they they take the foundation of the high elves and what direction can they go? Like, where what what route can they take to make them their own unique thing? And so they they've. Um, I'm hesitant to use this phrase, but I'm. I'm going to, for the time being, and the, the tack on the elemental aspect. And although I see the direction that they're going, and I understand fundamentally why that's a, a component of, of Hish, why, it's, why they're uh, attaching that, that enlightenment aspect to it, because that has sort of always sort of been a component of, of the realm of light, right? Is this enlightenment? And what does enlightenment mean in sort of a physical day-to-day aspect? And that's this in, uh, climbing the mountain monk-like uh, mysticism. And that's the direction that they've headed. Right now, to me, it does kind of seem a little tacked on or superfluous, or it seems very clear that they were just trying to try a new direction. Um, but I think as time goes on and they start to contribute more and more to that foundational mysticism and sort of steer farther away from like the magic as sort of a classic in a, like a classical sense and towards the elementalism, um, I think if it gets fleshed out and we get to see more of the river and the zenith and the and the wind, and it becomes a much more of a hallmark and not sort of a, a gimmick. Um, I think I'll be more on board in the future. So I, basically, what I'm saying is, I, it's it's fine the way it is, and I, 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 the models are gorgeous, and I really like what they've done aesthetically. Um, if if they are going to go that elemental aspect, I think they really need to dive into it, and I want to see more of it to sort of solidify uh, that um, as a as a full functioning component of this faction. Um, the like. I don't know, maybe Paul just said it, that the range is kind of small. And so I need, I need more to really get a, a better feeling of what holistically what this, what this army is going to be. But I think it's a great start. Um, and I love armies that sort of contribute and fit into the timeline as it exists currently. And it, I think it's going to be very clear moving forward that they're going to contribute a lot to the direction of the stories that we see um, moving forward. Um, it's, it seems like they are going to be major players um, in the same way kind of that high elves ended up being uh, in the old world. And so because of that, I, I, I look forward to it. I love the movers and the shakers. Um, so that's what we've got here. Um, any final thoughts before we close it out? Here I go. It's time for our reforging. But Sigmar Willing will be back soon. Like, subscribe, share, or leave a review. Join us on Discord. Drop a tip on our Patreon. Anything you can do will spread the word of Sigmar farther than we can on our own. Chat with us anytime about your thoughts on Twitter at The Mortal Realms. Paul, where can they find you on the internet? At PJ Shard. Josh, how about yourself? At J.E. Arrington. Uh, Pavent? I'm not on Twitter, really, uh, but I'm like sometimes in the Discord. Perfect. Uh, and I'm Aaron. You can find me on Twitter at Dos Asos, and you can find all our Mortal Realms shows and content at www.themortalrealms.com. Back, baby. I don't know. This one episode. Hey, what did the farmer say um, when the guy was stealing his tractor? I can't wait to tell me. I want to know. Hey, get off my case. <laughs> Uh, you see, Case is a brand of, of farming equipment. Oh, yes. wow. Um, it's the deep Wisconsin cut here. <laughs> sure. My sound uh, no. waves are way smaller than yours. Is that concerning? Yeah. Is it quiet again? Yeah. It is. I quiet feel is intimidated. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it won't matter because obviously I hack and slash this uh, regardless. But um, I do feel yeah. self-conscious yeah. about my tiny little lines, though. <laughs> I know, right? It's not, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not usually like this. Usually I'm much louder. Yeah. It's, it's not, not like a sound, sound wave. It's, it's like a sound <laughs> ripple. It's yeah. not the size of the sound waves. It's just it's really, what you're saying. It's really late right, at night, right. you know, and I just can't. <laughs> and it's, it's <laughs> cold in here. It's cold in here on these sound waves. Like... Is there anything else you want to talk about before it leads into the, the capture of Slanesh? No, Aaron. That's about it.